This happened seven years ago when I was a little more naive and 30 pounds lighter. Still, just as short though. It was a week before Christmas and I was finishing up my shopping. My mother, aunt, and nana are all big lottery people, so I tend to get them scratcher tickets and season tickets as gifts. I don't gamble really, so it's my one time buying them in a year. I always go to the same place down the street from me, and I wouldn't say I live anywhere dangerous. Not gated community level, but like a solid, children can walk around alone in dusk. Now I had an old sob that was the classic, no one can drive her but me level of finicky. Sometimes, she just wouldn't start unless she held down the brake and shifted through the gears, then put it in park, pushed really hard, and turned the key. It took forever to figure out the special secret handshake. The roof needed to be manually put back up if you had put it down, like it fell on your head, not a design feature, and just a lot of wonky stuff. My brother, who was a lunatic with toxic rage issues, but that's a different story, had broken the handle to my passenger side door right before this, after picking him up from scaring children at the hospital, so you couldn't open that door at all anymore. To get in the passenger side, you were either dukes of hazard in it or going through my side. So, it's Christmassy. A bit of snow and sludge, but pretty normal day. I go to the gas station to get my tickets, cash only, so enough money to make my purchase in hand. There are a few people behind me in line, and a few people playing Kino in the sitting area. There is one wiry guy behind me to the side in line, but I didn't notice much other than he was a little closer than I would personally have liked. I make my purchase, several $20 scratch tickets, they don't want anything less, bad odds apparently, a couple year long season tickets, adding up to just over $400. I pay the cashier and head out to my janky little sob. I sit down, close my door, don't lock it, and begin to count and organize my change and everything. Not even 35 seconds later, the wire man comes out and walks by my car. As he does, he stalls just for a second and tries my passenger side handle. It doesn't work and just makes a clunk as the handle is sort of free moving. It doesn't connect to the mechanical stuff at this point. My heart dropped and my stomach got sour. My body knew to panic, but my head hadn't caught up. He immediately keeps going, walked out of the parking lot and down the sidewalk. Until I thought about it later and had told other people, I didn't even consider that the man was probably going to rob me, or worse. I now very religiously follow the 45 second rule and am a lot more vigilant while Christmas shopping. No one won anything from those tickets I risked my life for. This story was when I was younger and braver. Kind of did stupid stuff without thinking. It's a wild ride and it's all true. I used to work at a pizza shop down the street from 2pm until they closed. I usually didn't get off until 11 or so at night. I had a car, but was close enough to walk, so I did that most days to save gas. This particular night, I was doing my usual thing, jamming to one of my playlists, tired, but happy to have a good job, and just generally happy with the way that my life was going. Up ahead, about a block from my place, I see an attractive guy in dark clothing walking, but not with a purpose really. He was taller than me, maybe 5'10 to 6 foot and had shaggy brown hair. The closer I got to him, the more I could tell that he was really good looking. Like even in the dark of night, I was starting to get excited. His features kind of escaped me now, but I do remember his hair and his thick eyebrows. I took an earbud out. Because I'm from a dangerous city and never really cared about stranger danger, I decided to talk to him, maybe even flirt for a little bit. How's your night going? It's good. Just looking to get drunk. Oh, that I can help you with. I got a mini bar at my place. I live just down the street. That was not verbatim. During the walk back to my place, I got no red flags from this guy. He seemed totally normal and I was honestly thinking, wow, just through sheer luck I met a super hunky guy and he seemed cool and fun. 
I was beside myself really. So we get to my apartment on the second floor. I jump into host mode and offer him to take a seat and make himself comfortable. The apartment is about 640 square feet, so it's very small. Except for the bathroom, you can see the rest of the apartment from any area. I head into the kitchen and while I'm pouring drinks, I glance back over at him. It was then when I noticed the first red flag. As I was asking him questions, he is more delayed in his answers, especially more so than he was on the walk over here. It was just odd to me. I go back over to the couch, pass him his drink and sit down next to him. So what do you do for work? I asked. Oh, I'm not here for sex. He puts his drink down on the table. What do you mean? I'm not after sex either. He stands up. What you got? He asked me. His nice guy and friendly face are gone now. I'm having a hard time processing what he means by this. I said, what you got? The second I stand up, he pushes me back. I fly across the room, hitting the floor, but not hard enough to pass out or anything. I get right back up, but he's already grabbed my laptop and my work bag. As soon as I start towards him, he cuts around me and makes his way to the front door. I am right behind him when he makes it outside. I manage to grab a hold of him and tussle again in front of the door. Now I shout out, calling on help from the neighbors. It's late at night so no one comes. I'm shouting, please help, I'm being robbed. The thing is, he has my laptop. It's not just any laptop. I hate to admit it, but my entire life work was on that laptop at the time. Imported photos that I didn't have backed up. Thousands of dollars in music programs. Video game programming stuff for a development team I helped. Really expensive software, etc. It was, in my mind, irreplaceable. I gave Chase downstairs across the dog walk park and started to gain on him. We tussle again and the only thing I could focus on is my laptop. I knew that I had to, at any cost, get my laptop back. That was absolutely all I cared about. Somehow I get grip on my laptop. I tug it again and I guess he decides I'm not worth all the struggle. He gets up and starts to take off. I now realize that he still has my work bag. It has my cell phone and wallet with my license, debit card, AAA card, etc. I take off towards him again and this time he shouts back at me. Follow me and I'll stab you again. This makes me stop in my tracks and he gets away. Underneath the street lamp along the sidewalk, I immediately inspect myself. Was I stabbed? No way. There's... there's no way. Then I see blood running down my leg. I see blood on my arm. Two places where he cut me good. I'm scared, but the blood makes it look worse than it is. I decide that's enough. I got my laptop, and that's all I really wanted anyway. I hobble back to my home and get inside and lock my door. I called the cops using my neighbor's friend's phone the next day and filed a police report explaining the situation, showing the stab wounds and declining medical services. I can't afford that and I was fine, all things considered. So all the guy got was a crappy cell phone and a wallet with like $30 to $40 in it. The cop called my friend back several days later and said they were not able to find the guy and that he would keep me posted. This was years ago, so I don't know where the robber is now, but I have every electronic thing of importance backed up on multiple drives to this day. So this happened years ago when I was a dumb teen girl who loved walking in the city alone after dark. This took place in Eastern Europe for context, in a city with a tramway system. On this night, I sat at the tram station, waiting to catch the last tram home. Three trams stopped at the station, two of which went where I was going. Important info for later. It was around 10 p.m. and as I sat there waiting, lost in thought, I barely registered a man quickly walking up and standing by the shelter. I thought nothing of it, just someone else waiting for the tram. Until I started feeling weird. The streets were quiet and dark and there was no one else in sight, just me in the sky. 
I started wondering why he chose to stand so close to me when he had so much space to avoid dealing with people. I couldn't comprehend anyone wanting to socialize this late at night, given that I'm not very social myself. So I glanced at him, trying not to overthink it. He was a bald-headed, beaded-eyed giant, tall and built like a bear, big belly, and big arms and legs. I was 5'2 and scrawny, but that wasn't what scared me. It was the fact that he was staring right at me, unblinking and expressionless, not even attempting to look away or act embarrassed. This guy wanted me to feel uncomfortable. I instantly felt weak and shaky, cold shivers down my spine. This was not normal. I quickly realized that this was not a good situation. I couldn't miss my last tram. Walking home was out of the question and my phone was almost dead. I was a shy kid and didn't have what it takes to scare this guy away. I knew that, but I had to at least try. I only managed to utter out a small, hi, try my best to startle him out of whatever he was thinking, but my attempt failed. In the face of a silent threatening aura, he kept staring, no sign of intent to reply. He was enjoying this. Feeling the panic rising inside me, I told myself to stay calm and think rationally. Maybe he didn't hear me. Minutes passed. His stare continued to burn my skin, and there was no tram in sight. Ignoring him did not work, so I mustered up the courage to speak once again, this time louder. What do you want? Stop staring. No answer. He definitely heard me this time. I felt myself start to get angry. I didn't want to let this guy get to me anymore. I didn't want to continue to give him the satisfaction of watching me squirm nervously and pretend that his behavior didn't bother me. I took a deep breath and forced myself to start thinking. I knew what I couldn't do. I can't fight him off if he makes a move and there's nothing I could say or do that will get him to stop. I didn't know what his intentions were but I knew they weren't good. If I tried to walk away, he would probably follow. I could run, but he would most likely catch up with me before I could tire him out, since his legs were much longer than mine. Even if I managed somehow to lose him, walking home through those dark alleys past junkies and gypsies that were always prowling about could land me in even a worse situation. I could pretend to call someone, but he might be compelled to act much sooner if he felt threatened. So, what can I do? The only realistic thing I could do was to try to outsmart him somehow. So I started developing a few plans, depending on which tram showed up, trying to confirm if he was just amusing himself and actually wanted a tram too, or popped over for another, more suspicious reason. I couldn't let him see where I lived, so if he followed me, I would have to prepare to employ whatever strategy available. And for that, I needed to stay rational and aware of my surroundings. While I was still thinking, the first tram showed up. It was one I could have taken home, but this one pulled into the depot in my neighborhood, forcing me to lead him to my home. I hoped that he would board it and leave me be. But he didn't. He kept watching me carefully. I let the tram go, desperately hoping it wasn't the last one to head home. He continued to watch, and I sensed that he was quite happy with how things were going. I put up with it for another 15 minutes, trying to focus on another plan of action. I could now pretend that I needed the other tram, the one going to a different area of the city, and just ride it to the next station, get off as soon as possible so I didn't end up too far and miss the tram I needed. This tram showed up next. With my heart in my throat, I boarded it and sat down by the door. He got on it too, but sat himself in the back pretty far from where I was. I let out a sigh of relief, thinking this might still go well. When the tram reached the next station, I got up and out, not looking back, hoping that it was all over. But when I stepped on the pavement and watched the tram drive away, I couldn't see him in it. I turned my head slowly and was terrified to see him walking towards me, looking slightly pissed off. He stopped just a few feet away 
and resumed staring, this time with a clear hint of malice, still in silence. My vision blurred as I fought back tears of despair. He was not going to let me go. The helplessness I felt was unbearable, but I couldn't cry. I couldn't give up. I had to find a way. I had to get home tonight. The prospect of what might happen to me any time now, if I didn't, was becoming too real. My head was full of unanswered questions, regrets, and horrible scenarios. I wanted so badly to not have to think anymore, to not have to fight back the tears and stay composed. But I knew this would be his cue to enact whatever fucked up plan he had in mind. I couldn't let that happen. Then I saw the final tram approach, the one I could take now, and got on as quickly as my trembling legs would allow me. When I was in, bright lights enveloped me. My mind snapped out of the nightmare spiral of fear and allowed me a moment of clarity. I had three stops to figure this out. I sat down at the front and looked at the driver. He was a frail old man, blissfully unaware of my distress. Gaining the driver's attention was a no-go. We passed one stop and there was no one else waiting to climb aboard. I turned around fully expecting to see the psycho had followed me again, but I did not expect him to be sitting right behind me. He was not taking any chances. He was making sure that I wouldn't try anything like last time. I shot him a hateful glare and allowed my anger to overcome my fear. I stood up and purposely walked over to another seat in the middle of the tram car. I wanted to make it clear I would not put up with this BS any longer. He got up too and slowly walked to a spot two seats behind and diagonally from me, then sat down with the tiniest arrogant grin on his face. Already expecting it, I shot up and stood by the middle of the door instead, determined to keep him on his toes. If I stood right by the door, he wouldn't have any idea which station I planned to get off at. He remained where he was this time, convinced that I was bluffing. After all, this was really the last tram. There was nothing else that I could possibly do to escape now. He must have reckoned. So my defiance was just a funny act to him. This was my last chance. I had to take a risk. It had to work. There were three doors on the tram, and they all opened and closed at the same time, and stayed open for about five seconds before closing again if no buttons were pressed or people detected on the threshold. The next stop, the only one left before mine came into view. The tram slowed to a stop. The doors opened. I made no move. Five seconds passed. The doors started to close. I bolted out and ran for it, reaching the back door as fast as I could and slamming the button to open it again. My whole body was tense with adrenaline. I waited a long, painful second and jumped back in, keeping my head low, holding my breath and crouching behind the nearest seat. I shut my eyes tightly and exhaled slowly while thanking the gods I didn't believe in for the button working and wishing with all my might for him to not have seen me before I got back in. As I was waiting to hear footsteps approaching, I pictured him frantically looking for me. Was he still on the tram, a face screwed up in anger, head turning like a fat ugly meerkat? Or was he catching his breath on the pavement of the last station, mad eyes searching the darkness for me? As the tram continued the loud journey, banging and clanking in sync with my heartbeat, I dared smile to myself, imagining his face when he realized he fucked up. Hand on my chest, I did my best stealthy look around the corner and found no one looking back. I stood up in excitement and threw myself at the foggy back window. There he was, standing alone and victimless on that slow, fading out of sight station, watching me leave him and his vile plans behind. Giving someone the middle finger never felt so good. I made it home and told no one my story for fear that I'd be admonished for being so naive. But I was safe. I was proud of myself. And I learned my lesson. Creepy Stranger, I hope the events of that day taught you not to underestimate girls and prevented you from being a criminal for the rest of your life. Let's never meet again.
This may very well not count as mysterious, I guess, but it gave me a weird gut feeling. It happened around this time of year, so I had a flashback on it recently. I can't make sense of this incident, but it creeped me out. Around this time of year back then, I would walk a bike path daily to this little man-made waterfall and back. It ventured through several parks and was overall in a pretty urban area. It was around 3 to 4 p.m. The bike path dipped several times under street overpasses and it's always a little spooky and sketch directly in the center of the dip since it's like you're in a tunnel created by the overpass up ahead. Anyways, I was walking down the dip and I hear a bike coming down the hill fast behind me. I step further to the right but don't look back and was startled at the fact the cyclist practically grazed me as it passed instead of giving me a wide berth. I was kind of flustered and annoyed. It all happened so fast. Then the woman stopped a bit ahead of me and started to look back at me and I thought, oh shit. But when she looked up in my direction, I realized the cyclist was actually a large child that I had mistaken for an adult. It was still kind of dark where she stopped, so I couldn't fully see her expression, but she stayed still with her head facing me for several seconds. I could tell by her silhouette that she was indeed staring back at me. She was just frozen and silent, propped up on the bike with her foot out, and it creeped me out. I wondered if maybe she was nonverbal and just expressing frustration about her near collision in the only way she knew how. Anyway, I stopped walking towards her because it felt a little eerie and I gently waved or something in acknowledgement. I don't think I said hi or anything. I don't really remember. Anyway, she suddenly turned and pedaled off in the same direction I was headed in. She wasn't with an adult or anyone that I could see. I kind of stopped thinking about it as I walked as she just seemed like an annoyed kiddo. But as I got to the end of the trail, I noticed something under my car. The trail meets up with a public parking, which happens to be a public school lot. It briefly borders the parking lot so I could see something under my car as I approached. I realized it was a bike, and to this day I'm 95% sure that it was the girl's bike. It was under the back of my car, like someone tried laying down flat and shoved it under there. I still feel extremely disturbed remembering it because I can't for the life of me think of an explanation behind any of this. At the time, I was worried that someone in the lot was watching me as I noticed the bike and removed it. But I didn't see anyone or have any problems as I left. I just leaned the bike against the tree and bailed. I didn't pay close attention to too many details about the bike when I saw the girl because it was such a brief encounter but I remember thinking it looked like a drab because it was white on white on gray or something very plain and not typically girly. I guess I could be wrong about it being her bike and it could have been a coincidence, but it was just so strange and I wanted to share my story on Reddit. If anyone can tie this together or if I'm just overthinking it, please let me know. So the other day I was out getting food and when I was ordering, this guy came up to me and told me that he was homeless and asked if I would buy him something to eat. I said yes and asked him what he wanted, but he didn't want anything from where I was ordering and asked me to follow him until he could decide what he wanted. At this point, I felt a bit uncomfortable and said that I was sorry, but I didn't have enough time to follow him and he just left and that was that. It doesn't seem like much, but I should add that when I was ordering food, he was asking me how old I was, if I was meeting anyone, if I was single, and if my boyfriend was around when I told him I wasn't single. I kept looking behind me on the way home, but I don't know. Maybe he was just over friendly or flirty, or was it something more sinister? I'm from the UK, if that's any context. So way back in 2016, when the whole killer clown epidemic was huge, I was walking through the woods around 10pm alone in order to get to a party that was happening in a secluded part of the forest. 
It was almost pitch black and I could barely see in front of me besides the flash from my phone and everything seemed normal as I was walking to the party. I got to a long stretch of woods with no defined path but since it was the quickest way to the party, I took it. As I got around midway through, I heard something to my left. I turned and saw a shadowy figure sat on a fallen log. I was understandably unnerved, but I couldn't make out if it was just a shadow from the moonlight or if it was an actual person. I made the mistake of shining my phone light directly at it and I was instantly terrified. Sat there alone in the middle of the woods was the largest man dressed as a clown with full face paint and sporting the creepiest smile imaginable. I tried to call five different people as I was passing him and then I heard him get up behind me. I instantly started sprinting towards the end of the long stretch onto the path which had a barbed wire fence down the side of it. During the sprint I was pretending to be on the phone with one of my friends as I could hear him running after me but there was no chance in hell that I was going to turn around to see if I was right. When I got to the path I jumped over the fence as fast as I could. I sliced my hand open as I did so. I turned around and kept running backwards as I saw the clown. He stood behind the fence staring at me with that same smile. I didn't stop running until I got to the party and I was scared for a very long time after this. You have to bear in mind that at this time there are many rumors of people being killed by people dressed up as clowns and while I never know if this man had evil intentions or was just trying to scare me, it was extremely strange and scary to live through. So in conclusion, Killer Clown Man from the Woods, let's not meet. So a little background. My friend and I decided at 10 p.m. we would park our car at the local park. It's usually pretty safe and we've been there many times, sometimes by ourselves. I'm a dude 5'7 and my friend is a girl 5'2. Usually we sit in there and talk or listen to music. This particular night though, we had parked in somewhat of a darker area. Keep in mind this parking lot is pretty big and there's already about 6-7 to seven cars in there. I'm in the driver's seat and my friend is diagonally across from me in the back seat. I notice a guy parking maybe six spots away from my car. The man gets out and is casually checking out my car. He starts walking through the park a bit, visibly getting closer, but eventually veers off. I don't think much of it until 15 minutes later he comes back, but this time is closer than before and is visibly trying to see inside. My friend is trying to calm me down, letting me know that there's nothing to worry about. He eventually gets back in his own car. At this point, I'm kind of keeping an eye on him. When he gets into his car, he backs out and parks right next to another car, only to get out and scope inside his car. He gets back into his car and then parks right next to us. This parking lot is huge and there are plenty of empty spaces. At this point, my friend is aware. We both are staring daggers into this man, and he looks at us, looks away, looks back at us, looks away until he turns his car off. He then gets out of his car right outside of the door my friend is at, and is just staring at us. Both of us are confused and obviously creep the fuck out. He was kind of older and completely by himself. While he's standing out there, he's shuffling a bit with the biggest smile on his face, never breaking eye contact. He gives us a very weird wave, almost non-visible. At this point, it's been about three minutes of us having this weird long ass staring competition. Our body language and facial expressions should have been more than enough for this guy to know that we did not enjoy his presence. My friend is feeling a bit uncomfortable, so I start to dial the police. I wanted to roll down the window and let him know that, but my friend did not want me to provoke him. So we ended up backing out of the lot and shortly after he pulled out and left. We got his plates and reported it to the police, but it's so fucking weird. Anyone have any explanation for his behavior 
or what he was doing. I'm a 15 year old male living in Gothenburg, Sweden. I was on my way home from a party this Saturday. I was with a group of friends, all males. Me and two others were about to take the bus and went down this long road to get to the station. On the way there, there's this guy in an apartment building. He asked us if we were drunk or perhaps even high. We answered no. He just seemed like a funny drunk dude. He went on to say that he had a huge party in his apartment with both alcohol and drugs. We declined his offer because it felt creepy and also because we really needed to get home. We talked about this and realized that there's no party whatsoever. He was alone in his apartment, no music or any other voices or sounds in the background. I've been thinking about this, if he was joking with us or what his deal or motive actually was. What do you guys think? This took place around five years ago. I was driving to work, a five hour drive. It was already dark. About three hours of driving and I started getting tired. I bought myself a coffee and some snacks at a gas station and went on. But the snacks and coffee can only keep you awake for so long and I started feeling tired again. This part of the road was nothing but thick, dark pine wood forest around me. No other cars on the road. Nothing. I was now extremely tired at the point I nearly drove off the road from almost falling asleep. I have to sleep now. I can't wait for a gas station. I need to stop as soon as I see a place I can park my car. Anything. When I'm tired, I fall asleep really fast. If I'm tired enough, I can fall asleep in the middle of a sentence when I'm talking. So it was a bit urgent for me to find a place where I could stop. It felt like an hour, but probably just five minutes go by and I spot a little pocket in the road. It's like a parking space for quick stops, like peeing, switching drivers, and stuff like that. Not a real resting area. I stop here, roll down my windows to check if I heard any weird noises. Totally silent. I put the windows up again. Nothing bad is gonna happen. I haven't seen a car for like 30 minutes. This road is empty. If someone is checking on my car, I bet it would be the cops checking on me if I'm alright. I leave my keys in the ignition and lock my doors just to be safe. I adjust my seat a bit to make it more comfortable to sleep and I take my shoes and put them on the passenger seat on the right. It was so nice to close my eyes and I instantly fell asleep. I don't know why or what but something wakes me up. I can't really see anything. Some kind of bright light hits me in the eyes. First I thought it was a flashlight, but then I realized that it's high beams from another car in my rearview mirror that is blinding me. I look at my left mirror and I can see a dude walking up beside my car. Maybe he wants to help or something. Should I make it clear to him that I'm in here? He is right beside my left back door. Should I step out and ask what he's doing? I didn't have to. The dude proceeds to jerk and pull on my left back door. I almost shit my pants when I realized he was trying to force his way into my car. My seat is adjusted for me to lay down. I can't reach the pedals which makes it impossible for me to drive my car. I slam on the car horn and it breaks the silence with a roar and the dude jumps. That gives me about two seconds to push up my seat enough to reach the pedals but it was still way out of adjustment so I'm kind of pulling myself to the steering wheel because my seat is laying flat and isn't supporting my back. Anyway, I start my car and drive off with a cloud of smoke from my screeching tires. It's hard driving a car with nothing holding up your upper body, but I managed. As I leave, I look in the rear mirror and I see the dude standing there looking at me and I can see two more guys coming up beside him. And from what I could see from the silhouette of the beams, one of them is holding something in their hand, like a wrench or maybe a crowbar. I drove off super fast, way over the speed limit. My whole body was trembling with adrenaline and fear. 
I drove like that for 30 minutes, then I stopped at a gas station to fix my seat and to put my shoes on again. I figured out that I was only sleeping for about 10 minutes. Well, I didn't have to sleep until I got to my destination, which was surrounded by heavy duty fencing and the building has an alarm. I told my boss the next day and they said they actually have problems with what they call in Sweden, road pirates. Criminals that force you to stop on the road and rob you for everything, including your car, in that specific area. It could have just been three nice dudes that wanted to check out if I was okay. But then why wouldn't they knock on my driver's side window? The thing in his hand could have been a big flashlight. Be safe. So now that the case is over, I can finally talk about it freely. I figured I would share my story of the time I got kidnapped. This happened in 2021. I was 20 at the time and had just got off work around 11 p.m. and I went straight home to get ready to go out and meet some friends at a strip club. He messaged me via Facebook Messenger to hang out and smoke and I told him I was meeting my friend and didn't want to hang out. So he offered to drive me to and from the strip club. Well around 12.30 a.m. He came to pick me up and said he had to dump some garbage first. He had a couch in the back of his pickup truck, which I assumed was the garbage he was talking about. He said he made us margaritas, but I told him I didn't want to drink till I got to my destination. So we ended up smoking marijuana on the way to dump the couch. It was about a 20 to 30 minute car ride to where we wanted to dump the couch. And by the time we got to the destination, it was about 1.15 a.m., there was this logging road right off the side of the highway that goes for miles. He pulled all the way down to the end and left the couch there, then got back in his truck and started driving back towards the highway. But once we got halfway back to the highway, he stopped and put his truck in park, then pulled out a pipe and started smoking some more marijuana. After taking a hit, he turned his head to me and stared at me for a minute with a weird smirk on his face. Then all of a sudden he almost looked like he wanted to jump at me but stopped himself in the moment with his hands and emotion like he was going to grab me. I got scared at this point and was frozen in shock not knowing if it was a joke or not. I quickly realized it was not a joke and opened my door like I was about to get out and he did the same. I closed my door and he closed his too. We ended up playing door tag and eventually got tired of it and got out of the truck and ran to my side. He opened my door and tried to pull me out by my legs. As I was trying to kick him, I pulled my phone out to call the police. Of course, my face ID didn't work in that moment and he ended up snatching my phone out of my hands. I kicked him hard enough to the chest and he flew backwards, falling on his butt. I grabbed my purse and hopped out of the truck and started running towards the highway. I kept looking back to see how far behind me he was and he gave me a head start before running after me. He grabbed me by my back of my shoulder and forcefully threw me down into a ditch. I landed on my stomach with one leg straight out and the other one bent in a weird angle. He sat on top of my legs and was holding my left hand behind my back. I screamed and begged him to bring me home and that I wouldn't tell him anyone. He got upset that I was screaming and tried to suffocate me with his other hand while still holding my left hand behind my back. I tried pulling his hand off my face with my right hand because it got to the point where I couldn't breathe. Finally, he let go of my face and I turned around to see what he was doing. And to my surprise, I watched him pull out zip ties from his jean pocket. He zip tied my hands behind my back, then forcefully pulled my panties off me. I had on a skirt and was laying on my stomach at the time. I remember digging my knees into the ground so he couldn't get them off. He didn't. He got up and started pacing, saying... It shouldn't have happened this way. Just do what I say. I cried, telling him if he was going to do anything to me, put me back in the truck, and he did. I'm not going into details about this part of the story, but what I did notice was, he pulled out a really small Ziploc baggie out of his jean pockets and pulled out a condom. I asked him what it was, and he said, It's for protection. After all that went down, he got back in the truck Mind you, I'm still tied up, and he drove me back to the highway and started driving around. I made up every excuse to get him to take them off of me, but he wouldn't. 
I asked for a cigarette. I don't even smoke cigarettes. And he lit one, smoked on it a bit, then held it to my mouth saying, I'll hold it for you. At this point, I thought to myself, what if I don't get myself out of this situation? I thought I was going to die. I started saying things like, you could be my sugar daddy and I will pay for dinner tomorrow. If pussy is all you want from me, you could have just said that. He loved that so much that he started saying that he would put me on his life insurance policy so when he dies, I can get the money. I asked him if he would take the zip ties off. They were so tight and cutting off my circulation. He pulled to the side of the road and pulled out a mini pocket knife that was on his car keys and cut them off of me. It took a few tries because of how tight they were and then he gave me my phone back. I had an Apple watch on my wrist and asked him for it after noticing it wasn't on my wrist anymore. And he had this surprised look on his face and said, we need to go back and get it. He turned around and we headed back to where this all had just happened. I got so scared and thought to myself, yep, this is it. I'm going to die tonight and no one will know until someone finds my dead body. Once we got there, he told me to stay in the truck and got out to search the ditch for my watch. He came back to the truck after five minutes and said he couldn't find it, but that he would be back in the morning to look for it when the light's out. We got back to the highway and headed back to town. Once we got into town, he asked me, what do you want to do now? I said, bring me to my mom's house. I have to work in four hours and I'm tired. It was about 4 a.m. by this time. He brought me to my mom's. After getting to my mom's house, I looked up his name on Google. He was on parole for first degree murder. He had served 17 and a half years in prison for murdering someone for their life insurance policy. I'm 25 now and I'm thankful I got to see another day. I was subpoenaed to testify against him and he was found guilty November 6, 2023 of all charges. As of now, he has not been sentenced. A little bit of backstory. In my late teens, 18 to 19 years old, I was no longer getting along with my parents and decided to move out. When I was a freshman in college, I went to a school and lived in a dorm that was located in a busy city. Parking at the school meant trying to find street parking and having to pay a meter. I opted to park at my uncle's apartment complex located a city away in the suburban town I grew up in. I would park at his apartments and take the bus downtown to my school. On the weekends when I went in my car, I would take the bus back to the transit center near his apartment and walk back to my car. It was a little under half a mile. One weekend afternoon, I took the bus ride to go fetch my car. After getting off the bus, I started walking to the apartments. I noticed a girl walking a short distance ahead of me. She was probably five years older than me. Shortly after I noticed her, she noticed me and began to walk slower. It didn't take long until I caught up to her. She waited until I was next to her and asked me what time it was. Not thinking of anything and being polite, I answered. She continued walking with me and we made small talk. At this point, I thought she was just friendly. She informed me that she lived in the apartments that I was headed to. We continued walking and making small talk until I reached my car. When I got to my car, she started saying how nice it was, which was the first red flag. My car was a 91 Toyota Corolla and by all accounts, not a very nice car. At this point, she started getting close to me as I was loading my backpack and items into my car. Her demeanor changed and I could tell at this point that she was visibly trying to flirt with me. Now for context, I had a girlfriend at the time who I was very faithful to. So this situation started to feel uncomfortable. She then asked me if I would come over with her to her apartment. I explained that I had a girlfriend and couldn't come with her. It was at that point that she crossed the line. As I was getting ready to get in the car and leave, she reached forward and grabbed my crotch, asking me if I was sure that I didn't want to come with her. I quickly swatted her hand away and firmly stated no. 
I quickly got into my car, turned it on, and backed out of the parking space, leaving her standing there bewildered that her forced attempt had failed. I left confused and uncertain of what just happened. Now, it's true that this could have just been a lonely girl that wanted company, but the lane she went to. For the longest time, I looked at this memory as humorous, but as I've gotten older and pondered it more, I now see how dangerous that situation could have been. I wonder to this day what might have been waiting for me if I stupidly had followed her. My intuition tells me that I may have been mugged by her and possibly other people waiting in her apartment but maybe I'm just paranoid. Either way, I'm glad I was smart enough to get out of that situation. I'm a female and was six at the time. So I was coming home from the movies. I was with my little brother, who was three, so we were pretty small. First, we had to drop off my aunt, so my mom headed that way. I was just playing on my tablet and we got to my aunt's house. My mom went inside with my aunt. Three to five minutes had passed. I see a man walking by the car and he opens the car door. I was in the back and quickly turned off my tablet, ducking a little. I glanced at my brother. I wanted to say something, but I didn't. I think he was asleep. It was pretty late. I heard him rummaging through my mom's cup holders. Then he closed the door and walked off with his hands in his pocket. Right after, my mom came out and she didn't see her phone. She took me and my brother inside my aunt's house and called the cops. I described the man and went home not thinking anything of it. I still wonder what if he had other motives. What if he didn't see me or my little brother? It's not too scary, but I just think what would have happened. I've been really into the sub lately and it's inspired me to share a few of my unnerving stories. This happened ages ago when I was 21. I was a manager for a big box store, but in a town that was an hour drive from me. I lived in a small town and the store was in another small town, both about 10k people each. But in order to promote to manager, I had to transfer which meant doing a daily drive. I hoped it would be temporary because I dreaded driving these every day, especially late at night because of deer, etc. This was before cell phones were the norm. I did have one, but it was one of those ancient style phones and I had just got it a week or two before. With these phones, you had to plug them into your car lighter in order to have them work and they had a cord attached headset. Anyway, one night I was driving home and it was really late, about 1am. The drive is pretty desolate, with houses sporadically throughout, mixed with sections of wooded areas. About 20 minutes before my town is a random casino. I had just passed this casino and a truck pulled out behind me. I didn't think anything of it, but it was noticeable pretty quick that they had been drinking because of their erratic driving. Because of this, I just figured I'd get as much room between us as possible. Also to note, as I was going past them, they had their headlights on of course and could have easily seen that I was just a young girl by myself. So the truck comes up behind me at a pretty fast rate of speed and goes past me. As they are next to me, they swerve a little bit towards me and I just think they are much more drunk than I thought and started slowing down so they could easily pass. As soon as they got in front of me, they started to slow down, way down. It got to the point that we were going 20 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone and still slowing down, like they were trying to stop me. Every time they would get to around 5 miles per hour, I would swerve to the opposite lane and give it gas like I was going to pass them, which would make them temporarily speed up. I could also see a little bit better into the truck. It was an extended cab truck with what appeared to be 5 or 6 guys in it. This was during hunting season, so it wasn't out of the norm to see a group of guys acting ridiculous and drunk this time of year. So they were trying to stop me, and I didn't want to necessarily pass, given what just happened. At a certain point, I had to. 
so I had to go try and pass the truck, but it blocks me from doing so by getting in the middle of both lanes. I try a couple times with the same result. Then finally, I try to floor it and pass the truck, but it tries to run me off the road. I immediately get back behind them, and I'm freaking out at this point. I have tried to call 911, but there was a huge area of no coverage, and I couldn't get through. After what seems like forever, I finally get through to them, and they send someone out immediately. As I'm on the phone with them, I see car lights in my rearview mirror, and filled with panic because I know this car would try to pass, given that we were going about 30 at this point. Sure as shit, this car comes up behind us and goes to pass, and sure as shit, this truck actually runs them off the road into a ditch. I'm telling the 911 dispatcher this, and in full blown panic. We are getting close to town now though, and I could see the first stoplight. I wasn't sure what the truck was going to do because the one lane splits into two and there are two gas stations up ahead. Right as we approach the first light, I see an officer come in the opposite direction and start flashing them over and over while telling the dispatcher that I see the officer. The officer makes a U-turn and gets between me and the truck. He flicks his lights on and pulls them over. They pull over into the gas station at the main intersection of town. I follow into the gas station to assist the police in whatever statements they need and make sure these assholes are actually arrested. That didn't end up being a problem because they refused a breathalyzer, so they were taken to a hospital where their blood alcohol level was obtained. I really wanted to know more, but the officer didn't elaborate. I kind of wish I would have called up and followed up on it. They never called me to do anything in court, so I guess they didn't need me, but it also means that they're getting away with only getting a DUI. I didn't realize this wasn't okay until way later, much too late to have done anything about it. All I know is, the officer said that they were three sheets to the wind. God only knows what their intent was, but I was terrified to find out. And thank God for that damn bag cell phone, it could have saved my life. I have posted a few creepy encounters before, but my wife had just reminded me of an incident we had in 2017 when we were working in Utah. This happened in late November 2017 and was on a weekday. Can't remember exactly what day, but I knew it wasn't the weekend as the roads were pretty desolate. I was 33 at that stage and had been working for a family on a ranch for about 4 years. They had become like our second family. We were on work visas from South Africa, so not native to the US, but pretty familiar with everything as we had been in the area for the four years we had worked for them. We decided to make a career in life change after I got burnout at 29 in the corporate marketing career that wasn't going anywhere and was stealing my soul and will to live. We just wanted to scale down and have a more relaxed lifestyle. The ranch was in northern Utah, somewhere between Salt Lake City and Logan. I'm pretty vague as the family is very well known and I would not like to identify them as I respect their privacy. We were almost getting ready to return to South Africa at that stage as our visas were running out. We wanted a bit of a holiday as it had been a busy year, getting married, our daughter was born, etc. We wanted to do a bit of sightseeing before we returned. The owner offered to pay for accommodations and provide spending money and his truck if we would run an errand for him on the way. He had a couple of horses and a trailer that needed to be picked up from a ranch somewhere in Wyoming. With Cheyenne being the closest big city more than an hour away. We jumped at the opportunity as we basically had a week to get there and then a day to get back to his ranch. We visited some awesome places, Park City, Flaming Gorge, Bear Lake, Yellowstone. The whole trip was an amazing experience except for the incident this story is about. That put a bit of damper on the excitement. We drove up to Park City the first day and spent the night with some friends. The incident happened on the second day of the trip. 
On the way between Flaming Gorge Reservoir and Bear Lake via Green River, we were driving and enjoying the scenery and had just crossed over the Utah-Wyoming border when we spotted the only vehicle for the past 30 odd miles, an old red-brown pickup truck that was parked on the opposite side of the road. There were two guys inside. When we were about 150 feet from them, they pulled into the road and made a U-turn. I was pretty pissed as I was going 80 at the time and had to make a hard break and swerve into oncoming traffic to avoid having an accident with them. I punched on the horn and flipped the middle finger out the window when I passed them. They sped up, flashing their lights behind me, but I just punched it and left them behind. I was driving my employer's new Ram 2500 diesel truck, so there was no shortage of power to get away. A few miles down the road, I could not see them behind me anymore, so I assumed that they had turned off. Probably about 40 to 50 miles up the road, we pulled off into a little America to get diesel and some food. When we got out of the shop, we saw the truck parked across the lot, but no one was in it. We decided to load up and head out, as I was not in the mood for an argument with some redneck cowboys. We headed out and thought that was the last we would see of them. Boy, we were wrong. We were looking for interesting places to stop and things to see on the route. And about 45 minutes or so after we left the Little America, we spotted a sign that pointed to Fossil Butte National Monument. We pulled in and literally had the place to ourselves. We walked around and couldn't see much as it was closed. So we decided to head out. Right as we got to the truck, we spotted the red pickup speeding into the parking lot. I panicked. My wife jumped into the back with our five-month-old daughter, and I ran and jumped into the driver's seat. Right as I wanted to pull out, the pickup pulled up behind us, blocking us from exiting. I was shitting bricks at this point, screaming to my wife to call 911. The guys jumped out of their truck and started running towards us, one on each side of the truck. Only then did I notice that both their faces were covered what looked like handkerchiefs, like what cowboys usually wear around their necks. Right at this time as well, my wife said panicking that she does not have cell service. I was making split second decisions and noticed that except the curb and signpost off to the left, there was nothing really solid in front of the truck. I threw the truck in drive, swung the steering to the right and floored it. The truck plunged through some sagebrush and made a wide turn through the field back towards the parking area. We raced to the exit. The layout of the parking area is one entrance, the road splits and the parking lot runs in a one-way loop that exits at the same entrance. If it doesn't make sense, pull up Google Maps with satellite view. That will explain it a bit better. We were parked at the far end of the parking lot and we're now going through the parking lot the wrong way to get out. The other guys were back in their truck racing to cut us off. They beat us to the entrance as they had a much shorter distance to cover than we did. They proceeded to park their truck sideways across the road by the gate so there was no way we could get around them without causing serious damage to my boss's brand new truck. We stopped about 150 feet from them. One guy had an aluminum bat Another had some sort of bar or tire iron that he was swinging around. My wife was crying in panic, our daughter was screaming, and I was shaking from adrenaline and fear. Even though the situation was still dodgy, I felt like we were out of immediate danger. The two guys did not move towards us, just standing next to the truck, staring us down. It felt like hours, but it was probably less than a few minutes. I told my wife to buckle our daughter in and look behind the seat for the rifle my boss kept there. She found it and passed it to me. I wasn't worried about the bat and bar, but in case one of them had a firearm. I did not want to make the situation worse, so was still contemplating whether I should use it if they approached and threatened us again. When I noticed a camper turning off the highway towards us. The two guys must have also noticed it as they looked at each other, got in their truck and sped off. They turned the way they came from onto the highway and when we could no longer see them, we started driving. We passed the camper and an old couple gave us a friendly wave. 
We wonder if they knew that to us, they were angels sent from heaven that day. The story ends pretty anticlimactic, and we had a pretty amazing but uneventful rest of the trip. We told my boss what happened when we returned, and his explanation was that they probably were looking for trouble. That's why they cut us off with a U-turn, and then when people react to them, they start a confrontation. It sounded plausible. About a week later, when we were already back in South Africa, I was laying in bed, thinking over the encounter when it struck me. From where we first encountered them when they cut us off, until Fossil Butte, was over 3 hours and close to 120 miles. You don't follow someone that far unless you have sinister intentions. They must have purposely followed us as there are many different routes that would have led them away from us and turned off the interstate and made 2 or 3 turns since leaving Little America. That made me lie awake for a few more hours wondering what their intentions were and what would have happened if the old couple in the camper did not turn right when they did. This happened a couple months ago to me and my mom. We were driving home from my aunt's house who lives in the middle of nowhere in the countryside. So we were on a pretty narrow and bumpy road which my mom was not super confident driving on. The drive was going normal until a green car appeared behind us, presumably pulled out of some driveway or something. It was driving extremely close to us, pretty much tailgating us on the road that really did not require that since it was so empty. My mom, who was already uncomfortable on the country road, became nervous and decided to pull in at the next house or driveway that came up so they could overtake us. We did, and the car passed. We were both relieved that it was over, but we were wrong. We continued driving at a regular pace and we didn't see the car for another few minutes. That was until we spotted it at the next house. The car had pulled in there and had its indicators on, meaning it hadn't stopped to park. My mom and I looked at each other and to be honest, I started getting nervous myself and I'm usually not frightened easily. The second we passed it, it pulled out and started tailgating us again. My mom was really scared now. The car would occasionally fall behind and intentionally race towards us at a crazy speed, which came across as them attempting to scare us. My mom increased the speed, but it kept up with us easily. I was sure that it was going to crash into us at this point or run us off the road. This continued until we reached crossroads. My mom took the usual left and I had no doubt that it was going to turn left too. However, it didn't. It continued straight ahead, as if nothing ever happened. I never saw who was in the car, and it still puzzles me. Why the hell would they pretty much be harassing two strangers who had stopped to let them pass after they made it clear that they wanted to? I just can't figure out their intentions other than perhaps being an unhitched driver who was having a bad day. I really thought my mom and I were going to be attacked, or worse. One of the weirdest things that's happened to me while on the road... I lived in New Mexico for several years before moving to the Midwest. My friend Amy and I, both females, would spend many days exploring the remote corners of New Mexico, discovering abandoned ghost towns and enjoying the quiet, desolate beauty of the desert. One afternoon in March 2010, we were traveling from Reduso to Albuquerque. Always up for exploring, we took a back road rather than traveling the more direct highway one leg of our journey had us on the MM-55. It's a remote, teeny, two-lane highway. We love those types of roads. Up until that day. This part of New Mexico is a flat and desolate desert. You can see for miles. There's virtually nothing except dirt and rock between towns. And towns can be miles apart. So we're on the NM-55 going north. After a few minutes, we see a white pickup truck ahead of us, going in the same direction. Suddenly, he stops his truck in the middle of the highway, blocking both lanes. We were about a mile away from him, and as we were getting closer, we began to get uneasy. We could see no reason for him to do this. We were the only other vehicle out there, 
and we began wondering if we should turn around rather than come up to him and have to stop. We were about a half mile away from him when he pulled to the opposite side of the highway, but his truck was still pointed in the direction we were going. We tried to relax a little. Surely this guy was just a rancher or something. Maybe he was checking something on his land. As we passed him, we noticed a few things. There was only one person in the truck, a middle-aged guy who never took his eyes off of us, and he was talking into a walkie-talkie. A few seconds after we passed him, he pulled back onto the highway and started following us, but he never got too close. He would get within a few car lengths and drop back a little, and then speed back up to within a few car lengths again. We were getting nervous. We realized how alone we really were. We had seen no other traffic on this road and hadn't told anyone about our great idea to take this detour. We checked our cell phones and neither one had a signal. Typical for remote New Mexico, but scary given our present situation. Amy was driving and speeding up while I frantically checked the map, hoping to find another road that would have more traffic. But there was no other road. We had to travel this one to get to the next town, Mountaineer. Turning around to go back the other way didn't seem like a good option. After a few minutes, we saw another pickup truck coming towards us. He was going very, very slow, maybe 20 miles per hour if that. This pickup was an old beat up pickup, whereas the one behind us was newer. Amy had us up to 75 miles per hour, which wasn't typical for us, as these are 55 mile per hour highways. We blew by the old pickup, and as we passed it, we saw another middle-aged guy, and he was talking into a walkie-talkie. After the white pickup passed him, he pulled a U-turn and turned behind it. As we watched all this, we could see the guy in the white pickup talking to his walkie-talkie. No doubt these two knew each other. We were being deliberately followed, and for the first and only time in my life, I felt hunted. They stayed right behind us. We watched for obstacles in the road. We truly thought the old beat up guy had set a trap on the road and our vehicle would be disabled somehow. We talked about driving into the fields. We were in an SUV, but this was obviously their territory and we were afraid of what would happen if we went off road and got cornered. So we stayed on the highway. By now the white pickup was right on top of us. We could see him talking to his walkie talkie and he stayed right on our bumper. The old beat up truck was right on top of him. The three of us speeding down the highway. The white pickup inched closer. His maneuvering and edging closer made it apparent that he was trying to bump us. I watched helplessly as he got within inches of our back bumper. Amy floored it. We were passing 80 miles per hour and edging up to 90. The road was flat and deserted, but any little thing going wrong would have been catastrophic. We absolutely were not going to slow down or stop if we could help it. The white pickup pulled into the opposite lane and started to gain speed. The only thing we could think of is he wanted to pass us and get in front of us. If he had got in front of us and his buddy was behind us, then we would have been boxed in and trapped. We looked frantically at the rocky desert on both sides of us. Our only option was to off-road it. Should we risk it? Could we speed through the desert and make it to safety in one piece? As we topped a small incline, we saw a sign for Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument and it pointed towards a road to the left. And right at that moment, a blue pickup truck pulled out of that road and onto the highway in front of us. As we came up on the blue pickup, we saw the plate said, U.S. Park Services. We looked at each other, then looked behind us. Both trucks did a U-turn and went the other way. We followed the blue truck to Mountaineer and then made our way to Albuquerque. I don't know exactly what those guys' intentions were, but they weren't good. There is something seriously wrong out there. I notified the state police and they said that they would keep an eye on things. This area is very near Berlin, New Mexico, which is where Terra Calico was abducted. It's also around 100 miles from Elephant Butte which is where David Parker Ray and his little torture laboratory were. We didn't put all that together until later. 
Even though David Parker Ray had died by this time, we do believe that there are others out there like him, and whoever abducted Tara has never been caught. Or maybe we came into a meth lab territory, but since it happened on an actual highway rather than a backcountry road, I tend to discount the meth lab theory. Whatever was going on out there, it's not good. So let's not ever meet or have anyone else ever meet these guys. A long time ago, my job had an office near the Canadian border in Washington State. I often had to travel over there to help out and help train staff. Being a guy in my late 20s, single, and liked to get away for days, I was always up to making extra cash by volunteering to go whenever the need was there. I would usually fly up there, but some occasions when I needed to bring equipment or materials, I would drive. This particular time was about 17 years ago. We had bought a bunch of equipment wholesale and needed to deliver this and some other odds and ends up to our office in Washington State. Of course, everyone knew I would volunteer to drive. I was told to drive a box truck up there and leave it and fly back. Prior to this, I would drive the company car or an SUV, but no worries, the box truck wasn't that big and probably the same size as a U-Haul rental truck. I always prefer to start my driving journeys towards the end of the day, mostly because I'm one of those people who likes night driving. For the majority of my journey, it was uneventful. I only stopped at a gas station and occasional rest stops to take care of nature. At some point near the California-Oregon border is when things started to get bad. It was approximately 1 o'clock in the morning. I had stopped at a rest stop, probably the last one on the California side. On the far side, I do remember seeing some truckers parked, but basically the rest of the parking lot was empty. Now at this point, I wasn't thinking anything creepy or out of the normal. I get out of my truck, go into the restroom, and take care of business. I wash up a bit and take my sweet time stretching my legs, but when I exit the restroom area and walk over to my truck, I notice a vehicle parked next to mine. I was literally like this whole parking lot and this person pulls up next to me. Oh well. I jump into my truck and continue my journey. About 10 to 20 miles down the freeway, my truck starts acting funny. Some of the interior lights start flickering. I don't really think anything of it. A little while later, the lights in the vehicle goes out. Interior lights, running lights, and headlights. At this point, it's about 2 a.m., and I'm in some wooded area in Oregon. I can't even find a flashlight in the truck cabin. I get so angry, not sure being scared to be driving 60 miles per hour in the middle of what seemed to be a scene out of Tales from the Dark Side, but I pound my fist on the dashboard and scream at the truck. Almost instantly, everything came back on. I felt like Fonzie. At the next upcoming rest stop, I decided to pull over, and maybe from the adrenaline or what, I had to pee like never before. I jumped out of the truck and went into the restroom, although this time I didn't take as long inside the restroom and walked back out to the truck. I remember my thoughts were, should I stay here till dawn or attempt to continue on? As I walk up to my truck, I see an older guy, kind of heavy set, gray hair, and he's standing next to my truck. I didn't see his vehicle near mine, but assumed he was out stretching his legs. As I walk up, he starts a conversation about the weather or something. A very light snow was falling, but not the kind of stuff that stays on the ground. I wasn't really paying much attention to him because my first impression was he was just some lonely old guy who wanted to chit chat. Then he says something that made my hair stick up. He's looking at my truck and says, are you having mechanical problems? I stopped in my tracks and felt the blood rushing to my head I just said, nope, just driving and trying to stay out of the cold. He then tells me that he doesn't live far from here and that I would be welcome to join him for hot coffee and if I needed to sleep on the sofa. That kind of gave me the creeps, but thinking to myself, if I needed to take this guy out, I was younger and stronger and not afraid to defend myself. So I basically end the conversation with, well, I better get back on the road before the snow starts to really fall. As I'm driving away, I see that he's walking behind the restrooms, 
So I think to myself, what the heck was that all about? My mind is racing, retracing the last few stops. How did this guy know I was having electrical problems with my truck? I suddenly think back to the rest stop in California and the car that was parked next to my truck. Could he have done something to my wiring when I was taking my sweet time in the john? A few miles down the road, no new issues with my electrical, but I decide at the next gas station, I will stop. I pull up to the gas station, and in Oregon, they don't let you pump your own gas, so I wait for an attendant and decide to go in to get a drink. I paid and as I was waiting for my fueling, I walk around the truck and look for any signs of tampering. Up near the front fender of the truck, I see some smears, but not really sure if it's from the road, snow, or what. I tell myself, okay, you're just freaking yourself out. I jump into my truck and as I pull out of the gas station, I have to turn around to get back to the side where the ramp is on. And as I'm turning and just about to exit, I see a car parked at the corner and someone inside. I think to myself, I'm just freaking myself out, seeing shadows in every corner. It's just a few hours before dawn. Maybe in the morning I'll laugh at this, but am I being followed and set up? Did I interrupt the guy when I came out of the restroom so fast? Was he following me and waiting for the right time and place to kill me for whatever I had in the back of my truck? As I continue driving, the snow starts getting a little bit more concerning. I didn't grow up in areas that snowed, but I have a little bit of experience driving in snow, but not enough to know when things are getting hazardous. I look out the side mirror and see a pair of headlights trailing behind me, which is odd because most drivers pass me up. This person is following me. I'm already going well under the speed limit, but I slow a bit more. He's still not passing me. At some point, I'm getting closer to the larger city, Portland. It's still dark and snow is still lightly falling. I decide to pull over and maybe the car will pass. I quickly exit the freeway and in front of me is another gas station with a patrol car parked there. I immediately pull up next to the cop and get out. There's a lady officer in there. I start making conversation with her about the snow and expected conditions. I'm thinking about telling her about the car behind me, but all of a sudden I felt silly about it. What was I gonna say? I think I'm being followed by an old man? She is kinda nice and we're talking for a bit and she asked me where I was going and where I came from. She does suggest I stop for the night and starts to tell me about the dangers of driving sleepy. I take a look around the area and say yes, I'll stop for the night. She tells me that if I go down the road a couple blocks near the 7-Eleven, there's a motel. I look around and do not see the car anymore. I decide that I'll stop for the night and go in and sleep. As I pull up to the motel, I decide to park the truck away from the room I got and park the truck behind the motel so that it couldn't be seen from the road. I get into my hotel room as quickly as I could Locked the doors, and I can honestly say I didn't get much rest. I watched TV and nodded off here and there, and would awake to every noise. My mind kept racing back to recalling all the events from before the California border to my conversation with the police. Maybe he saw me talking to the cops and decided to take off. Maybe he was waiting for me to pull over at another rest stop and complete whatever he was planning. Why would a stranger invite another stranger to his house in the middle of the dead of night at a rest stop? Why did he ask me if I was having problems with my truck? Finally, it was about 7 a.m. and I decided enough was enough. I get up, check out, go have a big breakfast, and continue to my office without anything weird happening. But I always wonder about that night and why I was being followed. This happened during the summer of 2017. Every weekend, I would wake up early around 5 a.m. for my morning workout. Then I would head to my job. Generally, I would leave my house around 5.30 because my morning drive took about 20 to 35 minutes, giving me enough time for two hours before I needed to leave before my shift started. Most of my drive was me just putting on loud music, trying not to fall asleep, and it being on the freeway before 6 a.m. Almost everyone was going at least 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. 
I would drive most of the time on the main interstate before turning off onto a smaller highway which I would only use for about a mile or so. This highway was three lanes on each side. People also drive fast on here, but usually not more than 75 miles per hour or so. And while you'd have some unsafe drivers in the morning, most people aren't swerving erratically. The highway runs north and south. An on-ramp from the main street becomes a lane. Then there are two other entrances from the freeway I would take every day. One from the eastbound side and one from the westbound side. I hope that makes sense. But basically, I got on the eastbound side right as three cars from the westbound side were entering. One was some sort of orange sports car and the other two were identical gray sedans. I don't remember exactly what the make of models were, but I do remember them being fairly uncommon models. Not a sedan you'd see a hundred times a day. One was in front of the orange car, one behind. These guys were going at least 80 miles per hour. The orange car would change lanes and the car in front of it would cut him off while the one behind it would change lanes to remain behind him. They kept this up the entire time I was on the highway near them, weaving in and out of cars, not slowing down. Eventually I pulled off my exit. This could have been a complete coincidence and just some asshole drivers, but I definitely got the vibe that the driver in the orange car was trying to get away from the gray cars. Maybe it was extreme road rage, or maybe something more sinister. Regardless, I'll never know. So to the drivers of those great cars, that's not me. I used to live in a medium-sized city near Paris. It was mostly known for its really useful train station and its big mental hospital. Patients roamed the city. It was mostly open for daycare. They were clearly not a threat. We just got used to seeing some weird behavior on the streets. One time, one guy, clearly from the hospital, threatened to take off my hair. He kept repeating it while following me, but I told him in a strict voice to stop walking, and he did. So we were just used to it. Context, I'm a woman. I was 24 at the time. I just started my new job. I used to live uphill in the city and used to drive downhill every day to park at the train station. On my way back home, I always used to drive by the hospital. There's a little road between the hospital and a primary school. It's a good shortcut to avoid traffic. It happened on a winter day five years ago. It was late, so it was already dark. I walked in my car and decided to take the shortcut to avoid the main road and the traffic. As I was driving, I saw a car parked on the side of the road shaking. I stopped, worried. It was moving left to right under the yellow street lights. I didn't see a driver in it. Then it crossed the road and hit the sidewalk in front and back and forth with no driver in sight. It was a red car. This was the one that sent the first car flying to the other side. The red car also hit the one behind it and it backtracked away. Then the red car started going in my direction and I started to get scared. At first I was just shocked but now I was really scared and I was alone in front of something really weird. The red car stopped. The driver's side door opened. I saw a guy getting up. It was like he had fallen asleep and left his foot on the accelerator which caused him to drive forward while laying down. He started smiling creepy at me. A little girl came out of the school and looked at me too. I know I should have called the cops for the traffic incident since the red car hit and damaged two cars, but I was so scared. I just drove backwards and parked away from the scene. I was shaking nonstop. I called my mom and told her everything. She told me that the guy might be dangerous and that I should go home by another route, like right now, that I might not be safe. So I did what she told me and drove home. To this day, I sometimes think that I had a hallucination because I was tired or something and that I had dreamt everything or that I'm going crazy. But my mom told me this week that she remembers my call and everything I said. She said I sounded coherent. So I guess it really did happen. I never took that shortcut again and I moved away two years later.
So last night, around midnight, me and my partner got an Uber from a friend's house back to my place. For reference, we live about a mile and a half away from my friend, but in a dark, sketchy part of town, so we didn't want to walk. We ordered the Uber and smoked a joint while waiting for him to show up. We get in and do the typical Uber greetings. It's a short drive, about 10 minutes, and it was about to be the longest ride of my life. He starts the conversation by asking if we had just escaped from a place called Sageview. At the time, I didn't know this, but after looking it up, it turns out to be a psych ward near where we were picked up. I told him no, just going home after a fun night. He laughs and says that he had spent time at Sageview himself. I ask him why he spent time there. He replies by saying, well, it's because I'm crazy. This unnerves me a little, but I figure we'll be home soon enough. And I joke back saying that I'm a little crazy myself and how everyone is in their own way. There's a very long pause before he says, I got arrested at my therapy appointment, said something that my therapist didn't like. This sets off many alarm bells inside my brain and I almost jump out of the car with my partner. I'm trying to silently get her attention, but like always when she's with me, she kind of shuts off her situational awareness and doesn't notice anything wrong. I decide to keep talking to him because the silence makes me uneasy. I asked him what he said that his therapist didn't like. He laughs way too long for a question like that and says that it doesn't matter. Then there's another very long pause. Then out of nowhere he says something in a threatening inflection. He was asking me way too much questions. At this point I take the hint and stop pushing the subject. I start directing him myself instead of trusting him or the map he is following. We had maybe two minutes left in the drive and I noticed him staring daggers at me in the mirror, not even watching the road. I tell him to just pull over and let us out because I feel no amount of walking is worse than being in a car with that man. Me and my partner get out and start speed walking away while he sits in the middle of the road watching us. I didn't hear his car start until we were down on the next street. I had already dialed 911 and if I saw his car again that night, I wouldn't have hesitated. I don't know what was up with that guy, but I hope I never see him again. And to top it all off, my partner was completely oblivious the entire time until I recounted the story with her once we were home. Well, this happened today two hours ago. I got a ride home from my university. I sat in the car and the driver rested his elbow on the front passenger seat and kept moving it back. I felt extremely uneasy and felt the guy getting ready to touch me. After 10 seconds, we stopped at a traffic signal and I told him I needed to get off. I've forgotten something in uni. He was like, no, ask someone else to get it for you. I told him, no, I can't. I need to go get it myself for my professor. Then a beggar came and he aggressively told her to leave. And then another came and instead of asking me to shut the window, he aggressively started shutting it himself, touching my knee. I said you just drop me off there, I can walk back to uni. He said no, I'll take a U-turn ahead and bring you back. Therefore, I spent the longest three minutes of my life in that car. His hand was in his lap during this time. The sad part is I called my mom and let her know I'll be late. And once I got home, she started blaming my clothes. I asked her how was my dress inappropriate and she started to blame my long legs. My sister blamed the institute for being too liberal and then such men roaming around to pick up liberal girls. This happened four or five years ago when I was like 17 years old and I had a girlfriend. I'm also a girl. I was at her house for the day. At this time, I didn't have a good relationship with my mom so I would sleep for weeks at my best friend's house. So I realized it's about 1 a.m. and I decided to call an Uber as I live in a kind of small city so buses stopped passing by around 10 p.m. 
I call an Uber and ask it to wait at the end of the block so it wouldn't have to take any unnecessary turns. When it got there, my girlfriend went with me so she could say goodbye. We hugged and kissed, but that kind of kiss that only lasts two seconds. I waved to her as I turned to sit in the passenger seat and say hello to the driver. He replied to my greeting and started driving. He looked okay at first, but I was really wrong. He was in his 40s, his head was shaved, and he had a large tattoo on his arm. He asked me if I was a student and I replied, yes. Then he asked me what I was studying at college and I told him I was actually in my last year of high school. He said I looked a lot older and I just laughed back awkwardly. This is when things started to go downhill. The conversation went something like this. Was that your girlfriend? The girl you kissed? Oh, yeah. How long have you been together? A year and a half. Whoa, that's a really long time. Are you a lesbian? Um, why? Don't be ashamed. I'm not homophobic or anything. I actually like lesbians. Oh. So are you a lesbian? How do you have sex if none of you guys have a dick? Uh, I really don't want to talk about that. Sex is normal. I want to know how you two do it. Um... Have you ever been with a man? Sorry, but I don't think this is appropriate to talk about. I've always wanted to experience a bit and have a threesome with two girls. Do you like men? Not really. It's okay. We don't have to have literal sex. I could just stand there and look as I touch myself. Uh, we're not interested in that kind of stuff. How do you know you don't like men if you've never been with one? Have you ever wondered what it's like? Friendly reminder, I was 17 at the time. My girlfriend was 16 and this creep was kind of 40. At this point, I'm freaking out. This guy was taking another route to take longer to arrive to my friend's house. And I remember thinking, well, this is the last moments of my life. This guy is taking me somewhere else. Maybe it sounds a bit extreme, but where I live, it's not that uncommon that this kind of stuff happens. I'm an atheist, but a fucking miracle happened and my friend called me. I put him on speaker and he asked me how much longer I'm going to take because he was worried. So I replied that the Uber driver is taking me another route, but I'll be there soon and ask him to wait for me at the front door. The creep panicked and took me to my friend's place. I opened the door and ran as fast as I could to hug my friend. At that moment, I walked into the house and I just fell onto the ground and cried my soul out. I generally thought I would die that day. I live in an apartment building that is safe and I live on the third floor. I was in bed napping around 3 p.m. when I heard a super loud bang on my door that wouldn't stop. I was sketched out, looking through the peephole. I cracked the door open with my gun behind my back. This 40 to 50 year old male claimed that food had been delivered to his apartment by mistake and handed it to me, already opened. Okay, a little weird, but I've done it once myself by mistake, so I didn't think too much of it. But he also kept the wrapping of the package with my address and name on it. While I was closing the door, he tried to hook his head around to look inside. Already creeped out by the guy, I went to the Amazon app and saw a clear picture of my package at my door with my apartment number included. So my theory is he took the package from my door and used it as a way to see inside my apartment to case the place. Open to theories or explanations. But to be honest, I've had an attempt at breaking and entering once when I lived in a rough area, so I'm concerned. But strange man taking my mail and claiming it was delivered to his place. Please, let's never meet again.
When I was little, I lived in an apartment complex that consisted of two buildings with a slight gap in between them. It was only about 50 feet, so I'd often walk there by myself to visit my mom's best friend in the other building. The apartments were surrounded by thick woods that had blackberry brambles, so thick that you couldn't stick your hand in without getting torn up by the thorns. This is relevant later. One afternoon, I went to my mother's best friend's apartment to deliver Girl Scout cookies and stayed later than I meant to because I was fascinated by her aquariums. It started to get dark by the time I was leaving, but I wasn't scared because the buildings were so close. I had taken about 10 steps when my inner voice started screaming. I'm older now, so I recognize what it was, but at the time, it was like I was being overwhelmed with an intense desire to poop. I looked into the woods across the parking lot and saw an intense red glow from someone taking a drag from a cigarette. I turned back towards the apartment, trying to pretend that I hadn't seen anything. But then I heard the sound of something large moving in the woods. I turned my head for just a moment and there's this large, scary looking man starting to run at me. I took off screaming bloody murder knowing that I was less than 50 feet away from the safety of my apartment. I could hear his feet slapping the pavement behind me and he was gaining on me. I was nearly on my porch steps when my uncle who lived next door opened his door to see why I was screaming bloody murder. I collapsed into his arms screaming about the man chasing me from the woods but by the time my uncle opened his door the man was gone. At first they didn't believe me because there had been nobody there but I was so hysterical they decided to check it out. They noticed an area had been disturbed in the blackberry brambles. They were so thick that my uncle had to use a machete to cut through them. About two feet into the area of disturbance, there was a small clearing with a pile of cigarette butts where the man had been standing, watching, and waiting for me. The man chasing me had disappeared so they think he ran between the buildings when I started to get close to the apartment door. So about a week after this incident, my mother's boyfriend Russ and I were riding dirt bikes through the woods by our apartment. There was a retainer pond that we liked to fish at, so we headed out there that day to see if we could catch anything. We discovered a campsite on the trail that hadn't been there a few weeks prior, and Russ decided to check it out. It was just a tent, cooler, a fire pit, and trash strewn everywhere. The trash part really bugged Russ because we believe in the leave it better than you found it principle and I could tell he was pissed. As we approached the tent he announced himself to see if anyone was in there and when they didn't respond he pulled back the zipper from the tent. After looking inside for a moment he ordered me to back up but the damage had already been done since I got a clear look at what was inside the tent. Attached to the walls and littering the floor was some of the most brutal and sadistic adult magazine content anyone could imagine. And the worst part of it was the graffiti that had been added after the fact. Most of the models had their eyes scratched out, lines across their throat like it's been cut, and their blood drawn and dripping out of their orifices. It's been over 30 years since this happened and the image is still splashed bright upon my memory. There was a torn sleeping pad surrounded by used condoms and the pad looked like it had substantial stains that could have been blood. Russ stood there in silence for a minute then told me to get on my bike because we were going home. When we got home he called the sheriff then led them out to the torture tent in the woods. They destroyed the campsite and it was never spoken of again. I never put two and two together as a child. But as I get older, when I thought about it, I realized how unbelievably lucky I am. I worked overnights at a 24 hour diner. You could probably guess what company. I'm used to weird people and odd things happening, but tonight was too much. Their restaurant backs up to a field that has a tree line and my cook and I went outside to smoke. We could hear someone yelling in the distance, but we get a lot of homeless people that come through this town that usually are harmless, so we just shrugged it off as weird and went back inside. 
Later, I came out again to smoke and throw some trash in the dumpster that's next to the field. I was stupid to go over there, but I hadn't heard him again. As I'm walking to the dumpster, I hear, Hey, come here. It was much closer than when we heard the man yelling the first time. I went inside and got my coworker, who owns a car with a spotlight on it. We shined it into the field, which again, not smart, and we admit that, but we really couldn't see where he was. But he kept saying, Hey girl, come here. I called the cops at this point because it was just too fucking weird. As I get off the phone with them, he comes walking out of the field. He's an older man wearing a tan trench coat and my coworker and a customer run back inside because this dude is hauling ass across the parking lot. He started to come towards the door and I called the cops again. My cook cut him off and told him he needed to go. The man was acting erratically yelling at the cook and said, I'll end your life the next time I see you, fucker. He kept moving his jacket by his waist like he was fishing for a weapon, but I couldn't see anything from inside. The cops come and get him down on the road, and an officer came basically saying that the guy is homeless and not mentally stable. No shit. We told him everything that happened, and my cook pressed charges on him. The officer told us that there wasn't anything they could do and he wouldn't give her his name so they let him go. Basically ended with, oh by the way, he's known to carry a knife in his waistband. Call us if you need us. Bye. He came back again hauling ass across the neighboring parking lot and back into the field. We could hear him screaming, hey come here, again and again. We got busy when the bars closed and haven't heard him yelling since, but I know he's still back there because I caught him sleeping behind the dumpster before. My manager comes in the morning and I'm going to try to get her to let me take pictures of him off the security tapes so I can warn the other third shift workers. The field that he's camping out also backs up to a middle school, but the cops said, again, there's nothing they could do. Hopefully, he moves on and leaves us alone, where the cops can catch him on something where no one gets hurt. Leaving my friend's house, I accidentally backed into a brick mailbox. My bike rack hit the mailbox, so my car was okay, but I completely demolished the mailbox. No big deal, right? That's why we have insurance, right? I went to my neighbor and told them what happened and gave them my insurance, phone number, and name. All I got was his first name. From the get-go, this dude was creepy. He was hitting on me, trying to date me, specifically trying to feed me. I'm attending out of state college and my parents are divorced. I left. On my drive to my mom's, the guy I backed into, Robert, began to text and call me. He was insistent that it was better for both of us to just pay out of pocket for the mailbox, sending me links to companies that would fix it for about $500 and demanding I go on a date with him so I could give him the cash for the repair and he could feed me. I don't know what his deal with food was. I declined everything and started to get annoyed by his constant calls and texts. Finally, after two days of it, with my response only, please contact my insurance. I sent him a text saying that he was harassing me. I blocked him. He made a new number and threatened to report it as a hit and run to the police. I'm in law school, okay? This wasn't a hit and run. I blocked the second number. Then he used a new number to ask me if I wanted him to send a screenshot or a video of the accident to his insurance. I admit, this made me angry. I called his number and dug my nails so hard into my thigh I drew blood as he threatened reporting things, asking me on a date and trying to entice me just to pay cash. I finally screamed, don't contact me again you fucking inbred piece of shit. My dad heard me and was upset that I said that to someone I was in an accident with. I told him I said that to a guy who thought I was cute and just wanted a date. I blocked the third number. 
Next day, he reaches out again to tell me that I gave him the wrong policy number. I told him I didn't. He then said it would be easier to pay in cash, that I was the problem, etc. He was talking to his insurance, I guess, and began trying to validate my info. He had my mom's name, address, and phone number. I verified it, told him not to contact me again, and blocked his new number. Next morning, super early, I get a text, basically saying he finished the claim, and that I was awful for making it harder than it needed to be by going through the insurance and not going on a date with him. He included, You're so beautiful and ugly at the same time. Don't take risks. Stay on a good path. Goodbye. At this point, I got scared. Fifth number blocked. Then at midnight, he texts, You up? I know where you live. Don't try to screw me over on insurance. I'll report it as a hit and run. You should have gone on a date with me. I took my phone to my dad, showed him the text, and filled him in. My dad, a pretty scary dude, then called the guy. He answers, Shoot, I knew you were into me. Want to come over? My dad got very mad, said this is beyond harassment. This is the final warning not to contact me, that we didn't care if he reported it, etc. Robert began saying I came on to him, offered sex as payment, invited him to my house, and was a horny bitch. Instantly blocked, police contacted, insurance notified, all the things. The next day, I talked to the insurance company, filed a protective order, got another text telling me I shouldn't have involved the police, blocked the seventh number, notified the police, and I'm staying at my dad's because this dude doesn't have his address. My dad is a very, very scary dude who loves his second amendment. Late last night, watching Star Wars with my dad and older brother, the doorbell rings. My dad goes to see who it is and it's fucking Robert with a trash bag filled with things that I supposedly left at his house. I call the police. My dad goes ballistic. Please come arrest the guy. The bag? Lingerie, a knife, lip balm, and Adida Van Tess fetish book. Just met with an attorney. Plot twist. Guy doesn't even own the house. He's a legal immigrant, is married, and is being deported. I feel awful that he's being deported. I generally think he wanted to rape or kill me. I go back to school in a few days, and I'm so terrified he or someone else will follow me. He was arrested for stalking, trespassing, felony assault. He tried to push my dad and spit on him. Insurance fraud. He lied about the accident to his insurance agent. Possession with a deadly weapon with a tent. The knife that was in the bag. Attempted breaking and entering. They just keep on adding charges. This is a story of someone I knew and had to cut ties with because he was a fucking psycho. The first half will be to add context as to why I cut him off, and the second half is what makes it a let's not meet story. It started four years ago when I was living at a friend's house while attending a nearby university. It was myself, my friend, his sister, and their parents. Roughly about two weeks into staying there, my friend's sister invited her boyfriend to live in the house too. And by all accounts, he was a pretty cool guy at first, very sociable and full of great stories. We often sat around the table for drinks or talked about life having a smoke in the garden. Within the first month, however, he started to get comfortable and cracks started to show in this veneer. He would rant about government conspiracies. He was big into the Sigma male bullshit and martial arts. And Christ, did he have a temper. He had this big dog he always kept in a cage that was extremely violent when he wasn't around. The dog attacked his girlfriend and had to be put down. That's when the guilt trip's torture began and the ranting became incessant. About two months later, he had the bright idea to live in a shipping container mainly because the parents wanted him out, and dragged his girlfriend along for the ride. I'm not talking about one of those chic little restoration jobs. This was a rented container in a storage yard among the outskirts of the town that we were living in. He would intimidate and threaten the staff there consistently until they called the police. 
This, of course, was another conspiracy. He became increasingly abusive to his girlfriend to the point where their family got involved to get her out of there. I stuck close to them having pretended to be on his side until they could safely get her out. They broke up which he blamed me for claiming I was poisoning her against him to make her mine. She has a new partner now and they're happy. We all blocked his psycho ex on everything possible but he continued to harass them until eventually he disappeared or so we thought. Fast forward to last year. I started to receive messages over social media from several different accounts, blocking each one in turn when I discovered who it was. Some friendly and some hostile. One of the profiles, however, was pretending to be someone I knew from university. We talked about life and how things were going. Eventually, I was invited to a house party, claiming it was a free house and plenty of people were coming. I booked time off work, made my travel plans, and kept talking to this friend coming up to the date of the party. I mentioned it to my friend's sister, and she was interested in going herself, until I mentioned the address, and she panicked. The address in question was a property that belonged to the crazy ex's father that was scheduled for sale. I waited until the day of the party and called the police to check the property, claiming a suspected break-in. They found five people there, including my ex. Parked out front was a butcher's van, equipped with food storage and a collection of knives, hammers, and rope. I'm glad I didn't go. This happened seven and a half years ago, June 23rd, 2016, while I was cleaning out my house. I was renting a house for a year and the year was almost up. I wasn't going to be living there for the next year so it was time for me to start cleaning out and moving my stuff to the next place. The house that I had at the time was fairly small but plenty of space just for me. I lived there by myself and I had just finished cleaning out the living room other than some basic furniture and I had to move on to clean the kitchen. There were quite a few cabinets so many that I didn't use a good number of them. I was looking in some of them that I didn't use to make sure there was nothing I had in them. One of them I opened up I saw something in the back corner. It looked like some type of shirt or rag. I grabbed it and saw that I didn't think it was mine. But when I moved it, it revealed a small white lever that you could barely see. The cabinet was in the corner by the sink and halfway blocked by the stove. I thought it was just another pipe, but it just looked a little different to me. I got inside and had to crawl into the cabinet, which was pretty large. Once I got inside, I saw that there was a small trap door to the side, leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You had to be completely inside in order to see the details of it. I decided to open the door, which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of crawl space. But when I go further inside, I'm horrified. I start seeing that there's food and several blankets as if someone had been living inside there. The good news, at least to me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figured how long the person had been there and how I did not know about it. I was gone from the house with work and a lot of other stuff, but I didn't know how it would be possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it was pretty late, and the next day after work, I continued. I was still kind of in shock with finding a secret room in the house, and decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet and went inside, then I pulled the lever open just like the previous day. But this time, as soon as I opened it, I saw movement, and then I saw a person for a split second. They slammed the door shut on me and I immediately turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car, then called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well. I opened up my phone, told the police the whole situation, and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever was in there was now gone. I was absolutely disgusted knowing that. This random person had access to my house for who knows how long. 
It felt like a vivid nightmare I needed to wake up from. When I opened up my phone to call the police, it showed the date was June 23rd, 2016, and I still remember this date seven years later. It stayed with me like a scar, a scar I didn't know I would ever heal from. Luckily for me, I moved out the next week. I don't really know how long the person was living in my secret room, but thankfully, it never gave me a problem. Thanks for reading my true horror story. As someone who has already experienced things like home invasion, I would suggest that you always lock your doors because you never know what people can do when they are in your house. It was early 2020 and I had just gotten a new job in a small town near my area. While looking for a place to live, my sister offered to rent her house to me. She had bought the house two years prior but her and her husband didn't really take to it as their commute to work was way too long, so they moved out and the house was uninhabited. Luckily for me, it was actually pretty close to my workplace, around 40 minute drive, and my sister pretty much rented it to me for free. I just had to pay for water and electricity and look after the house. I was living there for a solid two to three months and had already gotten used to it. One night after coming back from work and parking my car, as I walked towards the door, I noticed something odd. There was a cigarette butt on the curb to my house. I leaned down to pick it up thinking it might have been one of mine since I'm a smoker. But after looking at the brand name, I realized it wasn't mine and just threw it away. I didn't think much of it and just shrugged it off as some asshole throwing it on my curb. I went on with my night and nothing unusual happened. Two days later, I was once again walking to my house when I spotted more cigarette butts this time near my porch. Needless to say, I was pissed off and thought someone sat on my porch and smoked, but since I didn't know who they were, there was nothing I could do about it. I noticed that they were put out pretty recently, so it was probably someone who walked off as I was approaching. That night, I was watching a movie on my laptop and it was pretty late, past 1 a.m., so I was surprised when I heard a car passing by. It's a suburban neighborhood but it's during COVID time, so people rarely ventured out at night. I didn't think much of it. Around a half hour later, I was surprised when I heard chattering nearby. I listened intently, but I couldn't hear what they were talking about as their voices almost seemed muffled and quiet. By this point, I was getting a bit unnerved, so I stopped the movie and quietly got off my sofa. I walked to the front door to make sure it was locked. As I was approaching the door, I froze mid-step as I heard the two approaching my porch and reducing their talking to a whisper. I realized right away that whoever this was wanted to break in. I leaned against my front door and waited, expecting a loud bang against the door or the doorknob to be shaken, but it was oddly quiet. I decided to walk over to the window to see if they had walked away or changed their minds. My windows have bars on the inside that you have to unlock so you can move the curtains or look out the window comfortably. I slowly unlocked the bar mechanism and lifted it up. I moved the curtains and was taken aback. Leaning up against the window was a man. He was as startled as I was because he basically stuttered over his steps and jumped back. He tightened his hoodie to cover his face so all I could really see was his big blue eyes looking at me. His friend realized what was going on and right away started kicking the door in. He kicked it a solid four to five times, but the door wouldn't budge. All the while, I'm staring at them frozen in fear and trying to comprehend the situation. I snap out of it and slam the bars to my window, locking them, then running upstairs to the storage room where I pushed the table up to the door and called the cops. As I listened and expected the two men to come inside any minute, I heard a loud crash and the bars from the window being shaken aggressively. When they realized they couldn't get in, one of them let out a long, angry scream that probably woke up the whole neighborhood. By the time the cops came, they were long gone. The police couldn't find out who it was, but were more active in the neighborhood in the following weeks. Regardless, I wasn't too keen on staying there, so shortly after I moved out. My sister sold the house a few months later and as far as I know, nothing similar ever happened since. I honestly don't know what they wanted or why they were so determined to get in, but whoever it was, 
Let's not meet again. In 2018, I lived with my partner and my German Shepherd in the Humboldt Park neighborhood of Chicago. I was 33 years old and our apartment was on the fourth floor walk-up unit, very typical low-budget Chicago rental in a changing neighborhood. The layout of our building is going to matter to the story. Our building had about 12 total units. Mine and the three below me had a shared front entrance and the other eight units were through a second entrance. All 12 apartments had connected back porches and stairs that shared a walkway to the rear gate which led to an alley. From the front stairwell, there are windows on each landing to the back porches so you can see the back door of my apartment when standing at the front door through the window. We had good relations with our neighbors, especially those who lived directly below us and shared a front door. This was the thing that saved all three of us, my partner, my dog, and me. My partner was in a touring band at the time and would leave for weekends or weeks at a time. And it was a scary thing for me because I was essayed and stalked by my ex in my teens and 20s. I always worried something would tip him off and he'd start stalking me again. A little less than a month before a two week tour my partner had scheduled, I received a creepy Facebook message from my stalker ex from yet another account. About a week after, all my cars were broken into, the glove boxes were emptied, things were thrown around, but the only thing that was taken was a bag of dog treats. I had about $20 in change in the compartment between the seats and they left the money. I was on high alert at this point and very scared about the time I'd be alone during the tour. My partner was kind of irritated with me and the situation and felt that it was too last minute to cancel especially over what amounted to be a bad feeling and a few isolated things that weren't direct threats. And truthfully, car break-ins are common in Chicago. It's happened to me like 15 times and police usually do reports over the phone and don't even come out to the scene. What I found really strange was that the thief didn't take the money. There was a homeless man who had started camping on the boulevard nearby recently. My partner left for his tour and I set up cameras and bought door braces for the front and back doors. I became completely nocturnal, unable to sleep at night. My poor dog developed diarrhea, maybe because she was picking up from my stress level. It meant I was taking her down four flights of stairs for her to go blast her bowels out 67 times at night. I had this distinct prickly crawling sensation of being watched whenever I would take her out but I couldn't tell what was genuine and what was my own fear and paranoia. Her diarrhea lasted an unusual long time, like three or four days. I was going in and out from the main door a lot, feeling very scared, and I noticed some of my neighbors wouldn't pull the door all the way closed so the lock would engage. I mentioned it to my downstairs neighbor one day, including that I was extra careful because of my stalker. He was supportive, said that he'll mention it to the other neighbors if he saw them, and I noticed the door was locked more frequently after that. My partner came home about 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning, and about 8.30 a.m. that morning, my first neighbor's place was burglarized. He was a metalhead dude who collected instruments, sold weed, and psychedelics, and lived alone. I guess he went out for breakfast and left the door unlocked. While he was gone, someone had come in, eating his leftovers in the fridge, took a coat and a pair of boots, took his college diploma, but left the $500 in the same cabinet. They left all the expensive musical instruments and mixing equipment, left the drugs, but did take a set of keys. The keys were to the same first floor apartment and the master key to the front and back gate. My neighbors ran into each other right after the break-in and the second floor neighbor said, go tell no donut because she has a stalker, so my metalhead neighbor came up to let me know what happened. My partner had just gotten home from his tour when he knocked on my front door. I jumped out of my skin, but looked through the peephole, recognized him, and the three of us stood in the stairs at my front door while he told us about the break-in. We jabber-jawed for a while, about 15 to 20 minutes. 
While we were talking, we heard the front door open and close below us, but thought nothing of it. Then we saw a man climbing up the back porch steps to my back door through the window. There was no other apartment that he could be going to, and he had walked past all 11 more accessible units on his way to mine. He was not my stalker. I did not recognize him, but the image is burned into my mind. He was wearing flashy black and white high top sneakers, not the ones stolen from downstairs. His coat was oversized and hanging off his shoulders. We locked eyes through the window and he froze halfway up the stairs to my porch. He slowly took out his cell phone and called someone as he slowly turned around halfway up the steps. He walked back down the stairs in artificial slow motion like he was pretending to be nonchalant and bolted into his sprint as soon as he hit the porch below mine. My neighbor ran downstairs, dialed 911. My partner ran through the apartment to the back porch and saw a sedan and a windowless van pull out from a sketchy building two doors down. Both cars floored it out the alley. We didn't get the plates, but the cops said it wouldn't have mattered. There wasn't a crime committed and nothing concrete to justify stopping them. They very condescendingly explained this to me as they took my statement later. My neighbor is the one who actually called them and has the police report. My partner and I were considered witnesses. For a long time, the thing that scared me the most was the tool that my neighbor found when he went running downstairs. It was a 2x4 piece of wood cut to about 2 feet, but about 6 inches of it had been made into a handle. It was like a paddle and for the long time I couldn't figure out what it was, but I'm pretty sure it was to ram the door jams and locks. When I looked at my door afterward, it looked like the frame had been repaired, like it had been broken open before. It seems like they used the master key to place the ram, get someone at the back door to catch me if I tried to run away, and they'd break in my front door and go forward with whatever they planned. When we caught them, before they could catch me unaware, they seemed to abort the plan. I suspect they'd been watching me, especially while I was taking out my dog and figured I was alone. It was a pure coincidence that my partner had gotten home 30 minutes before this. I feel we all could have been horribly injured or worse had we been trapped inside and they had gotten the jump on us. Nothing else ever came of it except my landlord refused to change the locks but he did agree to let us out of our lease. I moved out of Chicago and now I have added a younger dog that I'm training to do some bite work. My house is surrounded by cameras and floodlights and wingnut neighbors. So whoever was on my back porch and whatever they had planned, let's not meet. This happened last night, November 15th, 2023. It was about 3.30 a.m. I was in my living room chilling on the couch watching Grown Ups. Suddenly, I heard someone outside fidgeting with my doorknob. My heart literally dropped. I immediately grabbed the knife from my TV drawer that I kept there for that exact reason. As the doorknob is still fidgeting, I fucking bolted upstairs. I grew more terrified because you could easily break the glass on my door and enter my home. Keep in mind that I live in a low income area and I myself are low income. There's no security cameras. I live in a small two story loft. There's no other doors to barricade in. My upstairs does not have a door. It's just an open area. I dial 911. The locks are still making noise. I'm on the phone for maybe 10 minutes whispering as loudly as I could. This person is still trying to break my locks. I can literally still hear the sounds in my head. I don't know if he or she was actually trying to pick the locks or just trying to spook the shit out of me by moving the doorknob like that because suddenly I could feel the person trying to push the door in but the door won't open. I couldn't see outside because I was too scared to open the blinds. At this point my heart is racing. The operator says cops are on the way. I start hyperventilating. Finally the fidgeting stops. I stay inside and upstairs. I look out the window and I see nobody. I can't really see at all because it's so dark. Cops show up later and ask me if I'm on drugs, 
but I'm actually completely sober. I had a basketball game, so I didn't partake in any substances that day. Keep in mind, I drink lightly, sometimes heavily, about three times a week, but no weed or anything else, and I've refused to take a sip ever since because of how spooky this was. I feel like I owe it to myself for staying on my toes. Anyway, back to the story. At this point, I'm shaking. They do a perimeter check and just bounce. No fucks given. They suggested I do not stay there that night. They said next time, try to get a good look at the guy. They said he could have been homeless, thinking that the house was vacant. But how the fuck could it be vacant when you hear Adam Sandler in the background? I was watching a movie in the living room for God's sakes. Someone was trying to harm me. It's so scary to think that if I was drunk or something and I didn't lock the front door, there would have been a random person roaming in my place. I ended up having a major panic attack when the cops left and I faint. I go into a weird shock faint. I literally don't sleep the whole night. Once the sun comes up, I go outside. I notice that there's trash all over because of the stray cats that got into my trash can. I go to pick up the trash and I start to think, could one of the cats been doing this? I mean, I've seen videos where they try the doorknobs. Then I start to think, could this have been another animal? Maybe a crazy person? But then I think about what person would raid your trash can and try to pick your locks. I start thinking from a paranormal standpoint. Then I think, the locks. The cops didn't even really check the locks. There's honestly no evidence or sign of any picked locks. There's tiny scratches on the wall, but nothing that would indicate the locks being fucked with. More like someone tried to stick a credit card in, but nothing was out of place. I start to think, was something or someone just fucking with me? Like as a joke? Not even trying to get in, just playing a weird ass mind game with me? Was this some type of visitor or something else? A fucking E.T.? I mean, come on, at this point I'm just paranoid, right? Some motherfucker was trying to get into my home. I'm spending a few days at my mom's house. I'm so fucking spooked. I haven't slept in more than 46 hours. I'm a relatively happy, lonely 23 year old guy, I guess you could say. My mental health isn't the best, but I've never been diagnosed with anything. I mean, what are we talking about here? Do you think it's possible that I could have experienced auditory hallucinations? Is there any chance that I actually might have been deranged to where I think someone was actually attempting to break into my home? I usually don't post shit like this on Reddit, but I feel like this is a good place to vent. Fuck it. Maybe someone has an encounter that's similar. I'm still pretty jarred from this experience, but I figured it would be easier to share about it than to keep dwelling on this. A couple days ago, someone broke into my house while I was sleeping. I work night shifts, so sleeping during the day is something you learn to get used to. Around 6.30 p.m., I heard what I thought was a loud knocking sound that was coming from outside, and my dogs were absolutely ballistic. For reference, I live in a farm out in the middle of nowhere. My closest neighbor is a half mile away. But back to the story. I somewhat wake up but don't really think about it since my neighbors like to shoot their guns and this is during hunting season. As I start to fall back asleep, my heart started fluttering weird like I knew something wasn't right. That's when I heard loud footsteps throughout my house. The dogs are still barking, but start to quiet down. That's when I really begin to worry. When I think my dogs would protect me in a time like this, fat chance. The footsteps stop on the other side of my bedroom door and don't move. I think this is how I'm gonna die. And although I had a weapon in my room, I couldn't really get it without being heard. It felt like an eternity before the steps moved around towards my brother's room. Rustling can be heard loudly through the house and things being thrown. I knew they were in my brother's room. Some of his friends are into CD situations and I knew it could be one of them. I heard the footsteps coming back to my door and the doorknob handle moves. I immediately turn my back towards the door and close my eyes tight, a hand over my mouth to stop me from screaming. 
The door opens, but that's it. He just leaves, and the car drives down the road. I finally bucked up enough courage to get out of bed. Everything in the house, except for my brother's room, was undisturbed. Immediately, I called my brother and asked him if any of his friends were coming over. He said not that he knew of, and I told him what happened. He got off the phone with me and started calling around. I went back to bed and noticed I still had my window cracked from earlier, and I realized I had my sheet off of me and only wearing a t-shirt to bed. If this was who I think it was, this wasn't a random event. One of my brother's friends has always had eyes for me, and the fact that he saw me sleeping in just a t-shirt makes me freaked out. Whether or not he took something from my brother's room or knew I was home sleeping before having to go to work that night, I don't know. Sometimes country life isn't so safe after all. Update Sorry y'all for the late update. It's been a crazy week, but thank you for being with me. My brother got back with me with the news I absolutely dreaded hearing. None of his friends said or claimed to have been in the house at the time of the incident. So now I'm even more afraid of who it was in the house and what their intentions were. They could have just been scoping out the house during the day. I just hope I don't have another visit like this anytime soon, but if there is a next time, I'll be sure to be ready for them. I lived in a small suburbish area of a small town. My house was very close to my grandparents' house. It went my house on one block. A large church with a large parking lot was the entirety of the next block, and then the block of my grandparents' house. My grandparents were both retired, so every day during summer while their parents were at work, a few of my cousins and I would spend the day at my grandparents'. Honestly, it was such a fun childhood to have. When I was around 11, my parents bought us a dog. One of my chores during the summer was to walk over to my house and let the dog out to use the bathroom and then go back to my grandparents. One of my cousins who was a year older than me would always go with me. But one day when we were on our way back to my grandparents, a guy drove next to us. It was one quick motion. He opened his car door and yelled, Gotcha! My cousin and I took off running he quickly shut his door and sped ahead of us into the parking lot of the church. Instead of running through the parking lot, my cousin and I ran behind the church, but continued in the direction of my grandparents. When we emerged from the backside of the church, the guy was still in the parking lot, his head on a swivel, looking for us. We continued to run. A few heartbeats later, he spotted us. We heard his tires squeal again after us. Thankfully, we were very close to my grandparents and quickly made it inside. We ran in and told my grandmother, who of course didn't believe us, and told us to go back outside to play. So my cousin and I went back outside. Still spooked, neither of us felt like playing and just sat on the front porch. Soon the guy drove back and slowed down as he passed. We ran back in to tell my grandmother, who again didn't believe us, and told us to go back outside. Well, the third time of us coming in and interrupting her soap opera, she finally came out to the front porch, and at the same time, the guy passed again. She called the police, and when we were talking to the police officer, the guy drove by again, and we pointed him out. But the police officer just took our statement and left. We never saw the guy again. I would like to think that the police officer pulled him over and scared him into not bothering us again, but I highly doubt it. We were at a sportsman warehouse in Colorado with our parents. I was 14 and my brother was 12. We were on a trip to see family. So we were about done walking around and decided to sit down on a camping chair while we waited for our parents to get done shopping. While we were sitting in there, a lady that looked cracked up on some sort of drug walked up to us and started asking us weird questions. She asked us, Where is the Colorado River? Can you show me on this map in the front where the Colorado River is? 
There's this map of the U.S. in front of the store, right by the entrance. She kept telling us to walk up there with her because she needed help finding the Colorado River on it. We were both weirded out and started to walk to find our parents. She kept following us and didn't stop. We found our parents and told them what happened. My mom started to yell at the lady, but she wasn't going away even after that. We checked out and started leaving the store. When we walked out, we saw the creepy lady and three or four men run out the store towards a van that was hidden out of camera view. Two of the men were waiting outside the store and that's when I realized what was happening. The lady wanted my little brother and I to go to the front of the store so that the two men could abduct us and run to the van. I'm so glad we followed our instincts and didn't follow the lady. To this day, I'm still very cautious when I go into town, especially because I live near the border of Mexico. Don't talk to strangers, even if you are an adult. You never know how many people are in on the abduction. I started a new job this month, and my workplace is only two blocks away from the bus stop, with one of those blocks being a public sport place with a public pool and running tracks, etc. I always go through there instead of around because it's shorter and busier so I feel safe. However, the next block is quite lonely with not a lot of traffic from cars or people. This morning, I was about to cross the street and an SUV stopped. I didn't find it weird because I thought the driver was being kind and letting me cross before continuing on their way. After that, I kept walking really slowly because I always make sure to arrive exactly on time and I was like 5 minutes early today. As I was about to turn right, I finally realized that the same SUV was a little bit in front of me, almost at my side, turning right really slowly. My workplace is surrounded by houses and in a decent neighborhood, so when I saw him driving slowly I just assumed that he was going to go park in front of his house. However, he didn't stop and I thought, oh well. Maybe he has to open the gate on the porch. I don't know. But instead of getting out of the car, he just stayed in there. That freaked me out, but I kept walking. Like I said, really slowly. When I was about to be at the side of the car, I didn't know what to do. Should I run? Walk normally until I pass him? Or what? So I started walking more quickly, and when I was on the side of the car, he waved or did a sign at me. I don't know. I didn't catch it clearly. I ignored him and finally passed him, but once I did, he started the engine again, and he was right by my side. I finally arrived at my workplace, and he stopped again. I quickly rang the bell. I can actually open the door from the outside, but I didn't want him to see how. Also, by ringing the bell, I was basically telling other people to come outside for me. Immediately after I rang the bell, he accelerated and left. I feel really bad for not memorizing his license plate number or even remembering his face. I really hope that no other girl has to go through this. Even if I had all his information, I'm from a third world country so police won't do anything about a potential creep. Now I'm scared. What if he comes back? What should I do? He knows where I work. Okay, I'm just looking for opinions on this encounter, because although it was years ago, I always think about it and wonder, what the fuck? So basically, we were crossing the border from Costa Rica to Nicaragua. The border has a long-standing line where you have to wait to go through the border control, and there's a bunch of taxis on the other side. The line is long. My friend and I, both female and 23 at the time, we were at the back of the line. This man comes up to us speaking Spanish. We don't understand, but he guides us towards the front. We don't understand, but he guides us to the front of the line and puts us next to two other American girls. We are confused and ask what is going on, but he says in broken English, you four together, I take you in taxi. We think it's weird, but we did skip some of the line, so we stay next to the girls. 
We talk to them, and we all agree that we think it's very strange that he put four young backpacking girls together when we clearly didn't know each other and is aggressively making sure that we get in his taxi once we cross the border. Anyways, we cross the border and he's waiting for us. He begins leading us to his taxi. We tell him no and immediately jump into another taxi with two male backpackers who seem safe. As we look back, we see another guy yelling at the guy who is trying to get us to come with him. They are fighting. He seems to maybe even hit him in the head for possibly not getting us in his car. Was this normal or was he about to traffic all four of us? Bad vibes here. This next story is my mother-in-law's story. I was about nine years old when I attended catechism school. It was like any other day until it wasn't. I remember like it was yesterday. It was getting close to Christmas as I attended my weekly class and when I finished, I always walked home. As I was on my way home, there was this old rusted beige four-door car parked on the side of the road with a man leaning over into the car. He was wearing dirty jeans and had a long sleeve shirt on with what appeared to be work boots. I kept my head down and continued to pass by him until he said, Hey, excuse me. I stopped and turned around. Yes? Can you please help me? My car won't start. I stood there and just stared at him. He then continued talking, asking me to help push something in as he couldn't reach it. I walked closer to the door and looked inside. I leaned over to push a button from inside. Little did I know at the time, it was just a cigarette lighter. As I started to get up, he put his hands on my butt, trying to push me into the car. He said, No, you have to get all the way in to press it. I screamed on the top of my lungs. All right, all right, he said as he stepped away. I quickly got out of the car and started walking away. The man gets in his car and starts driving in my direction. He pulled up right next to me and said, are you sure you don't want to come home with me? I screamed and he sped off. After he was out of sight, I ran home and didn't stop running until I reached the front door. I was out of breath scared out of my mind. I ran to my room and slammed the door, crying my eyes out. My sister came into my room. She's five years older than me. She asked me what's wrong. I told her everything that happened. She told me that we needed to tell my mom. As she started to walk out the door, I grabbed her arm. No, don't. Don't tell mom. I didn't want my mom to find out as I thought I would get in trouble. My sister ended up telling my mom, and she called the cops. A few hours later, the doorbell rang. I was scared and hid in my room. There were two policemen standing at my door. They came in and sat down and asked what happened. Scared as I was, I told them everything. They asked my mom if she would be willing to take me down to the station to look through a book so I could possibly point them out. Looking through the book of men... I spotted him, the guy that tried to kidnap me. Him, I shouted, pointing at his picture. That is the man. The officer said, thank you, you did good. We went home and about a week later, the police officer came back to the house and asked me to point out the guy who tried to kidnap me from another book. I pointed out the same guy in two different books at different times. They thanked us for our time and left. That night, I went to sleep and woke up screaming, screaming from a nightmare. My mom came running in and I was crying. What's wrong? What happened? The man, he took me. He threw me in his car and took me home. He hung me on his tree. He put me on the top of his tree like an ornament hanging me on the tip of the tree. My mom told me it was a dream. I was so scared I slept with my parents that night. The next day, my mom called the police office and asked them what was going to happen. The policeman said since he didn't physically harm me or kidnap me, they couldn't do anything. At the time, I didn't think much of it. 
I was young, but attempted kidnapping and they did nothing? Years later, when I was much older, I found out that years after he tried to kidnap me, he got someone else and ended up killing her. That could have been me. One night, around 3 a.m., I was sitting at home on the PC, watching movies, playing games, etc. When I noticed, I'm out of cigarettes. The only thing that's open late at night is our local gas station, not too far from my house, but it's still easier to go by car. I took my keys and locked the house and went to the gas station. I live in a small European country, which is the most safe country on the planet. Still, that doesn't mean that bad things don't happen here and there. When I exit from the suburban area I live in, you need to take a right to take the main road. After that, you can just go straight for half a kilometer and then go another half kilometer to get to the gas station. On the way, I noticed some girl on the sidewalk. I usually drive slower at night because a lot of times people would speed and go through red lights at this time. She was walking faster than usual. It looked like she was panicked and it was two guys behind her who were about 10 feet away, maybe less, pointing at her and doing some hand gestures towards her. They gave me a real creepy vibe. As I got closer, I noticed the girl had a scary look on her face, like she was about to cry, but she didn't. So I pulled over close to her and very quietly said, Are you in trouble? She looked at me and gave me a head nod. I told her to get into the car, and she did. I told her I was going to the gas station to buy some cigarettes and that I would take her home after I finished. She thanked me like a hundred times. I asked her if she wanted to report it to the police, but she said she only wanted me to take her home. I went to the gas station, bought some cigarettes and a bottle of water for her. She was clearly in fear. I took her home right after that. We passed the same street where those two guys followed her, but those guys were nowhere to be seen. Imagine if I didn't run out of cigarettes that night. When I was a kid, no older than 10, I was walking to the mailbox to get the mail for my parents. I was fully clad in my baseball uniform, ready to go. A car pulled over and an elderly woman urged me to get in the car. Immediately, I knew something was up. Come on, we're going to be late, she insisted. She went on saying that my bag and glove were in the trunk, telling me that my dad had given it to them. She said my dad couldn't take me anymore, so he asked them to take me since they lived nearby. I honestly don't remember what I did. I just remember the anxiety from piecing together what was happening. I want to say that I booked it and ran into the house, but as I've gotten older, I don't even remember anymore. All I remember is being back at the house and the creepy lady ended up ringing the doorbell. When my dad answered it, he was obviously confused and she told him that they were testing me to see if I would jump in the car. The most unsettling thing to me is, I don't remember if I actually got in their car. I'm not particularly old, but the experience pumped so much adrenaline into me that I truly don't remember it well. I try to remember. I can picture both outcomes of me running home and me going into the car. I don't remember getting scolded, so I tend to assume that the former occurred, but I'm still not sure. Testing a child or not, what a fucked up thing to do in your free time. It makes me wonder if this couple actually had the intentions they spoke of. I remember getting home and not saying a word to my parents. The shock was still fresh and I had no time to process what just happened. Was ringing the doorbell afterwards some sort of cover up for a failed attempt to avoid being reported to the cops? Has anyone ever encountered something similar? I just find this whole situation extremely off-putting. You don't really find too many kids walking alone with their baseball uniforms and coming up with that on the fly gives off the impression that this wasn't this lady's first time trying to coax a kid into her car. So I have many creepy stories to share, but I'll start with this one. This happened when I was 13. 
and I definitely looked like a 13 year old. I was a late bloomer. I was walking to a friend's house about a 20 minute walk on a summer's evening, so it was still daylight. The middle aged man in the car slowed down and asked me where I was going and if I wanted to get in and he would take me. I giggled like a teenage girl does and said no politely and continued walking. He drove off and did a U-turn back to me, this time demanding that I get in his car. Teenage me gives the attitude and makes a face and continued walking. He starts revving his engine, speeding back and forth enough times to remember his license plate. By the time I had got to my friend's house, I had let the encounter slip my mind. Fast forward a few days. I brought it up in general chit chat with my mom and she was horrified. She called the police. I was mortified because she was embarrassing me and I could take care of myself. Anyway, the police came and took my statement. Remembering the license plate came in handy. They went straight to his house where his wife said that he was with her the whole evening. The police came back to me saying he matched the description I gave them and that he's been given a slap on the wrist. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall once the police left. As an adult now, I love to know what he wanted with a 13 year old child. I'm a female, 25, and I work on a cruise ship visiting countries around the world. Sounds cool, but it's hard work and may put you in some weird situations. This day, I was transferred from one ship to another. Usually when you disembark from a ship, you leave with many other people disembarking and get into a bus hired by the company to take you to the airport. Well, this time was different. I was leaving the ship in the middle of the cruise and I was the only one. It was my first time in that country, North Europe, and I get out of the ship next to the crew admin and find two different cars with two different drivers to take me to the airport. The admin is the one that made contact with them and she is lost, no idea which is the correct one. One of them started to grab my luggage and putting it in the trunk and the other approaches to stop him. They start arguing badly in their language, which none of us could understand. She then asked for the credentials of both to decide whom she would send me with. Needless to say, my mind at that point was going as far as the idea of human trafficking or other possibilities, and I did tell her that. Her face seemed concerned and confused as well the whole time. One of them gave her an ID with a picture and a company logo. The other one, only a business card from the company. She then said she was going to check them. And I thought, good, we'll see what's going on here. But she straight away sent me with the first one. The one that has the ID card. As she said, she knows the names of the company. Well, of course, I didn't go chill. In the car, I was sending messages to my mom and boyfriend, sharing my location and explaining what was going on. Also, I opened Google Maps to see if we were going in the right direction. The driver then starts a voice call, also arguing with someone, and I try to download as fast as I can the translator so I can record and get the meaning. When I finally got it, he finishes the call and does not start another. He does not talk to me at any moment and keeps an unfriendly expression. I proceeded to check Google Maps and to my despair, he does not take me the route I was hoping for. He then stops in a place that looked like a bus station, leaves the car and starts taking my luggage out. I ask, what is this place? And he says, it's the airport and we need to go to the immigration. I follow him to the entry and it's a huge building so I do believe it maybe it's an airport, just a different entrance, but I'm not yet chill. He takes me to this corridor. We finally check my documents with the officer and he leaves me there. Okay then, I finally breathed. To this day, I didn't find out if the other driver was official or not. Once you leave the ship, you hardly have contact again with the people working there. It could have been something very innocent, but maybe my gut didn't trust that at all. I don't know if you consider the story really eerie, but I know I was scared and I wanted to share it with someone.
Hey everyone, before I begin, this has been reported to the local police with as much detail as possible. I have been searching for several hours on who to reach out to or how to put into words something I went through this evening. I came across this thread seeing someone post a similar thing last year. Tonight, my girlfriend, 22 female, and I, 23 female, were heading home from a picnic at our local park. As we drove away from the park and approached the stop sign, I noticed that there was a car parked at the stop sign. I remember thinking to myself that that seemed really odd. We pulled up to the car and stopped, and when I looked over I saw a man, his wrists tied together, a terrifying expression on his face as if he was screaming and crying for help. I froze and asked my girlfriend if she had seen what I had. As we pulled just forward from the car, she asked what I saw, turned around, and he was still there, wrists together on the steering wheel, staring and making eye contact with her. We both panicked, asking, Do we call 911? Do we circle back around? Trying to make sense of what we just saw, and I think it both hit us at the same time when we realized that it was most likely a tactic to lure us closer to his car. I know I've personally read multiple stories of possible trafficking tactics happening in my country. I am lucky to have seen these and knew to get away as soon as I could. Sure enough, when we drove off, he followed us for about a half a mile until we got to a busier road and lost him. I have been in a state of fear and confusion and panic ever since. It may seem like an overreaction, but I have, one, never been in a fearful situation such as this. Two, never seen someone tied up in possible danger before recognizing the signs, of course. I guess I'm looking for reassurance, wondering if anyone out there has been in a similar situation. I'm really shaken up by this and truly baffled that we live in a world where this happens. Stay safe, everyone. I've been clean from all drugs since 2019. It took me a while to write this. I never thought I would be posting this because of how stupid I was and the stupid mistakes I made. I know I'll get all the duh comments, so don't even say it. I already know. I'm telling this story to remind people that everyone's intentions are not what they say they are. I am mentally traumatized from this experience and I get reminders of it every day. I'm grateful to be alive and have no idea what would have happened if I didn't get away when I did. So save the rude and cruel comments. Thanks. This story is based in September 2017, I believe. Such a fucking blur. I did whatever I could to survive in this harsh world. So please no judgment. I was on the streets, no family, and a soon-to-be meth addiction. Backstory, I started using crack in 2015 and figured out that if I sold my body, I could make easy money. I know, not ideal, but I was deep in addiction and at that point, I didn't care about anything. January 2017, I met Ty, who also smoked crack but worked every day, so I no longer had to do that. I was going on like 8 months free from selling my body and my soul. Also, when I met Ty, he had a place in the big city and he did a lot of work for people in the city. I was left on the streets by the man I had thought loved me at the time. I must have said something wrong because he flipped out and left with everything I own in his truck. Fuck, we had just spent two days getting high and I was sure he was just throwing a fit. So I went over to my friend's, let's call him E's house. It was my home away from home and I felt safe there. E was an older, maybe 60 year old man who liked to get high and over time became one of my best friends. I was able to take a shower and put on clean clothes. When I was done, I remember sitting on the couch with disbelief that Ty would just leave me like that. I started crying and wishing things had been different while E held me and comforted me. I knew deep down that I needed a fresh start to depend on myself and live a happy life. Across the street from E's house was a hometown bar where rappers and musicians would perform. And on that particular night, the bar had been filled with people from the bigger city about a half an hour away. Let me explain. Where I come from, there isn't a place for addicts to get clean. 
They do have women shelters, which I have been to before. About 30 minutes away in the bigger city, where they have all the help you can ask for, if you're willing to do the work. At this point, I was ready to get away from everyone and everything. I had no hope of cleaning up my life if I stayed anywhere or close to where I was using. Remember, you have to remove the old playmates, playthings, and playgrounds. So that's what I needed to do. I went right over to the bar and found a semi-good looking guy headed back to the city I needed to go to. I told him I planned to go to a shelter in the morning and he told me I could just go with him and he would take me in the morning. On the ride, I remember feeling like a hundred bricks lifted off my shoulders. I had nothing but the clothes on my back and an Obama phone with no minutes. The guy I was with had a pretty sweet ride. I said, you don't fuck with this right? And I pulled out my crack pipe. He shook his head so I rolled down my window and just let it go. I knew I was going to be in the shelter and had to get better. Not just for me, but I had kids and a family that at that time still hoped that I would get better. I wanted to start over. I just didn't know how hard it was going to be. Me and this random dude go to his friend's house and smoke a blunt. And I don't remember anything after that. I woke up on the floor of a clean room. I mean, clean. There was nothing in it. It smelled like paint. As I looked around, I realized this was the place dude was talking about moving into. I got up, and he took me to get coffee, and then right over to the shelter. I was fucking terrified of what I was walking into. I had no idea what to expect. All I knew was I needed to better my life, and I needed to do it now. As we drove into downtown, I got a little nervous, because I knew that downtown was full of crime and drug dealers. Big buildings and confusing signs, tons of people and traffic. I then realized I was going to have to work really hard to get my life back. We pulled onto the street and before I knew it, he was dropping me off. There I was standing in the big beautiful clean lobby, just feeling lost and broken. I had been with Ty for almost 7 months and this was the first time he left me like this, so I was kind of hurt over that. I knew he had been seeing someone else in our recent month breakup and he wasn't afraid to show it. This place smelled like lime with spotless white walls. I walked up to the desk and was asked if I was homeless. Yes, I said. She didn't even ask me any more questions. She just looked at me with the sad eyes and said, Okay, hon, let's get you set up. She took me to a small room full of boxes and she hands me one. She explained it was for my personal things. I look at her with unsettling eyes and replied, I don't have any belongings. I had lost everything the night before. The nice lady gave me some toiletries and a pair of leggings. Next was intake where I had to answer a bunch of questions and was handed a paper with all the rules on it and on the top of it. And on the top of the piece of paper, it stated there is no Wi-Fi in or around the building. You had to go down to the stop sign to get internet. My phone was off, but I could still use the Wi-Fi, but at that time, I really wasn't worried about it. I knew Ty was already probably staying with the other girl. Michelle was her name, so I didn't feel it was necessary to even try to use my phone. I decided to cut off everyone and try to be different. When she was done giving me the rundown on how things worked, she took me into the day room. Walking from the lobby was weird and I remember feeling sick going through those double doors with the stairs off to the left. Under the stairs was a pile of mats. I was told to grab one. I followed her through the double doors into the day room, which was huge. It was filled with at least 50 females. A lot of older ladies with nowhere to go, but it was loud and bright. The walls to my left were full of lockers, which I was told to get one if I stayed there long enough. And in front of the wall, about 10 to 15 tables set up where most of the girls were sitting playing cards, coloring, and talking. The other side of the room was a shower bathroom and a small TV sat in the cart on wheels. Next to the cart was a table that had electrical strips full of chargers and phones. In the far back corner was a door that led outside to go smoke. It was nice. There were picnic tables and lawn chairs set up with a huge fence in the yard for the kids to play in. 
When 7 p.m. hit, the whole dynamic of the room changed. Everyone was moving around. People were running in and out. Then you hear over the speaker, Roll call. Then you were instructed to go and get one mat to sleep on. They passed out blankets and pillows to those who were without them, and they let us keep the TV on. The first night was scary and lonely. Here I was in a strange place, not even two full days clean, off a week-long crack binge. I was up half the night, and my head was just racing. I finally fell asleep when the other girls started to get quiet. The morning came way too fast, and the rule was, you had to get up by 7 a.m. You didn't have to leave, but you had to get up. A lot of the older ladies didn't leave the shelter. They knew they had a place to stay, and had nothing else to do all day. So they hung out together at the shelter all day long. I had to go upstairs for breakfast, which was okay. I'm not really a breakfast food person, but that morning I was starving. I had a whole damn eggs, bacon, and milk. After breakfast, I went outside for a smoke, and I noticed a teeny black girl with cornrows in her hair had some cards in her back pocket. I had been playing cards since I was a kid. My dad had taught me a few games. I played with friends and I also had done some time in jail in the past. I was lonely. I didn't know where anything was and it was obvious I needed help. I asked the girl her name and if she wanted to come play cards and after two games we had a connection. She was cool and she liked me so I was okay with that. I can be awkward around new people and females tend to not like me so I find it hard sometimes to make friends. She asked me after playing a few more games of rummy if I wanted to go into McDonald's with her. I was cool with that because I needed to learn the area anyway. On the walk there, as I was talking, something caught my eye. So I looked up and there was fucking Ty with all of my belongings in his truck right by us. I tried to call but he ignored me every time. Guess he was done with me for good this time. That crushed me. I wanted to fall to the ground and just sink till I disappeared, but instead I got about 10 different emotions running through my body all at once. I was so angry that he was looking for some reason to leave me. Since a month before we broke up and I stayed at my dad's for a while. That's when he started seeing Michelle. I was just absolutely devastated. We continued our walk to McDonald's and I was silent and broken. That night was easier to sleep because I was exhausted from not having any sleep and just feeling done. I slept like a baby to be honest. The next day, Mish wanted to show me the place that she goes to for free lunch. The only thing was, it was a church and we had to sit through a 30 minute sermon, which I guess was cool with me. We were standing outside waiting for the church to open their doors and this blackened out Mercedes Benz with a trailer hauling a badass Harley pulled up and parked in front of the church. I then heard my loud mouth say, Damn, that's a nice fucking setup. I looked at Mish, and she looked back at the Harley. That's when I saw him. I specifically remember everyone knowing who he was. Will is what they called him. I remember getting excited to meet new people and to be part of a new community. Everyone was really nice going into that church. A guy at the door gave us a pamphlet of meal times and services offered. I followed Mish to one of the back pews and slid in behind her. The church was pretty, different colors, and there was a choir singing in a low, almost quiet tone as people were taking their seats. I kind of froze when I saw that guy I saw come in. Will sat next to me. I looked at Meech and then quickly noticed the guy's gold watch. It could have been fake, but it almost looked like a Rolex. He was an older black gentleman, talked real smooth when he introduced himself with his hand out. I was shocked that he wanted to shake my hand. No one in my life does that. I shook his hand and they were creamy, like he took very good care of them and obviously does not work a physically demanding job. He was nice dressed and had his pimp hat on like a fedora. It even had a feather in it. His cologne was strong but smelled good, like a man. He was handsome and smooth. He was also very confident. Sitting through the sermon, I found it hard to pay attention to the preacher. I remember looking at his clean, shiny black leather shoes 
and his socks that were black and thick. When the service was finally over, people started heading out into the dining area. I just followed Mish and we got our food. She picked an empty space to eat on one of the ends of a long table full of chairs. Not even five minutes, not paying attention to our surroundings, just eating. Will came over and sat three seats away from me. He looked at Mish and said, Do you mind? I know I didn't see any red flags. Of course, I see them now. But looking back, I was so clueless. He hardly said a word the whole time we were eating. And when he was done, he got up and threw stuff away. And I assumed he left. Misha and I decided to go home and play some cards and go to the clothing bank she knew of. We were walking home and talking when he pulled up next to us. He rolled down his window and asked if we needed a ride home, but he was looking at me with a steep stare. I looked back at Mish and she refused. Smart girl. And I went with him. I'm a dumb girl. I think I was more curious than anything. I did not know how he made that kind of money and I remember wanting that. We drove around till curfew and just talked. I don't know what it was. I think we had a lot in common and we related a lot. He asked me how I ended up at the shelter and just asked me questions and I told him. I don't know what it was. I'm not sure if I trusted him, but I told him about my past anyway. How I sold my body for drugs. How horrible it was. And I even said I'm glad I didn't do it anymore. He didn't really say much about it and we agreed that we would continue our talk the next day. He said he would help me put in a couple applications and he had some errands to do too. I woke up the next morning to a text from Will that said, What if you made that kind of money, but spend it on yourself, not drugs? Everything you make will go to building your life. Just think about it. I thought about it. I'm not going to say why I agreed and went on with the idea that this would work and I could actually get my life together and my kids back. $200 a half an hour. I could be free. I chose to go with him. At that time, I think I thought I wanted to be with him, but really, I just wanted a way out of the situation I was in. I hated that stinky, loud shelter. I wanted out. He got me a room at the motel, and we dropped off my stuff, and he told me that I needed some new clothes. He did tell me that he had just got fired from a trucking company. He was a truck driver. He was currently trying to find another job, as far as I knew. He took me shopping and got me a few new outfits more or less outfits to take pictures in to bring in money. I knew what I was getting into, but I was preparing my mind to handle everything that was about to happen. Will did tell me that if I went with him, I had to stay clean and have a clear mind to make money and be smart. Looking back at how manipulative he was, made me believe that I would do this to make a better life. I started doing this a few times before I got addicted, a few times to make rent, or bills, so I knew I could mentally do it, but I was still unsure about where this was going to go. We got back to the hotel and I do my thing. I take pictures to post them. It didn't take long before I started getting calls. I did make some money and I kept every penny and Will took me shopping. I remember the shoes I bought. They were black and gold, baby fats. Oh, I loved those shoes. I got like six or seven cute outfits, some makeup and hair dye. Remember, I came to the shelter with nothing, so being able to get all this stuff made me feel so good. I was confident in myself and was hopeful that I could get a place to start my new life within a few weeks if days like that repeated itself. Remembering how things went, I am starting to think I was a part of his game, making girls think they could do it and keeping the money, and just trapping them, and making them need you. It's sick. He tricked me. He made me think I could finally live a clean life. Yeah, I was escorting, but I treated it like a job. I bought another phone, so I had a new number, and used the Obama phone for work. I thought wrong. I later that day went back over to the shelter, and grabbed one of the shirts I had, and some personal things I left with Will. That night was cool. He was super chill. We talked in separate beds. 
We got two beds, and he didn't act like he was interested in me, which I was happy about because I didn't want to be with anyone. I needed a break from emotional attachment. After Ty left me, I felt like I wouldn't trust anyone like that in a long time. So I was happy that I was in a comfy bed watching TV, freshly showered, with money in my pocket. I had the best night's sleep and woke up to breakfast and time to get up and get myself together. He got up early, went and got us breakfast and coffee. He ate with me and then left, said that he would be back in a couple hours, take my time and do what I gotta do. So I did just that. While he was gone, I dyed my hair and the works. Not long after I was done, the door opens and the female walks in. She's pale and has a beautiful face, long pretty blonde hair that ran down to her shoulders. She was real petite, way too skinny, and size B chest. She had pretty big blue eyes and had dark circles under them. It looked like she had been crying and she was carrying a black trash bag that contained all her possessions. Will walked in behind her and introduced her as Anna and she needed help too. He instructed me to get her together, get her pretty and take some pictures and post them. He then told her to go and take a shower and asked to talk to me outside. We went outside the door and as I was shutting it, his voice got real stern and said, I see you have not made any money yet and why the hell is that? I tried to explain that Sundays were the slowest days. I would be lucky to make any money today. Before I could finish, he cut me off and said, I don't give a fuck. You need to make some fucking money. What, you think this hotel pays for itself? I pay for it. I will pay for it tonight, but for now on, you pay half and half of all expenses. Now go make some fucking money. I couldn't believe he was talking to me like this. I had never seen him mad and his voice scared the hell out of me. I was looking at him when he cut me off and I could see him get angry. His eyes got wide and the white just disappeared and they became all black. I was scared but I did what he said. He left me alone for a while while he went out and got food and whatever he did. When Anna got out of the shower her skin was more exposed as she walked out of the bathroom in a small towel. I knew she was addicted I assumed heroin. She confirmed that after I asked her if it was going to be a problem not to do drugs because that was a rule for me. Why wouldn't it be a rule for the other girls? After my kid's father passed away from my overdose, I didn't like to surround myself with girls I knew I could get close to. So I cut that all out. And when she told me, I was like, okay, no girl, I'm sorry, you're going to have to make some calls because you can't stay here. At this point, I didn't care what Will had to fucking say. I didn't want her here, period. As soon as he came to the door, I stopped him and took him outside. I told him I don't think I could work with her. I didn't want to be around a heroin addict or any kind of addict for that matter. He did make her pack up her stuff and took her home. I think he was trying to please me for some reason. Will and I then rode the main street where all the girls walk and work. It was so weird. I don't know why I didn't just run then. I'll never know. About an hour or two of driving around, talking to a bunch of different girls, this random ass girl jumps in the car. It was crazy. They had known each other for years, I guess, and she had been looking for him and wanted to make some money. She was quite a bit older than me, but still really pretty, like beautiful. She had long, thick, curly, jet black hair. I didn't really get a good look at her until we were back at the hotel. Will told me he wanted to get a few girls together to make some big money. I was going to be number one and that I would never post with another female because I'm number one. He told me that I was important and we were building our own family. Amy was tall and thick but she was gorgeous, big blue eyes, pretty skin, small waist with a big round butt and she was a straight up bitch. She took benzos. She was prescribed to them. I guess that's why he allowed it. It wasn't long before I couldn't help but watch her. She was popular and then like at night she'd be falling out of nodding off. It drove me crazy. I think I even started to fight with Will about it once. I didn't think it was fair honestly. 
Like, bitch can get high, but I can't. What Will would do was, during the day, he would leave me at the hotel to make money, and he took Amy to the street to work her. Well, it wasn't two days before they came home with yet another girl, a young one, 18. Her choice, no family. I only know what they tell me. Her name was Amanda. She was short like me and a little chunky, which was okay. Guys like chunky too. She had blonde, long hair and a cute face. She was sweet and didn't say much. I tried to get to know her a little better, but she wasn't around for long. I posted her with Amy and she didn't get much feedback. Most people that were calling were calling for Amy. Amanda stayed with us for a few days, but she decided that she wanted to go home. Will, Amy, and I didn't stay at the hotel for long. We ended up deep into the city, the furthest away from our hometown. Bigger room and a nicer hotel with a view of the whole city. It had a shitty microwave and a drive-up entrance to your room. Will and Amy brought back two girls that night. I don't remember them much because I wasn't involved with them much. I posted them, and the next day, we made money. Every time a girl would make money, they would give it to Will because he had them believing that he was saving it for them and getting them everything they wanted. I continued to make money on my own and also gave him my money. I got conspicuous and I will never forget the moment I knew I was not safe. I was outside smoking a cigarette. I wasn't there long, but when I came back into the room, Will had all three girls posing on the bed and he was coaching them how to pose and take snaps of them. I didn't say a word and closed the door slowly. I don't know why I felt the way I felt, but it didn't feel right. I don't know if he heard me open and close the door, but I heard him yell my name and said he needed me. He handed me his phone and told me to post the pictures. When I got on the website and tried to post the pictures, it now wanted money instead of posting ads for free. Will, unhappy, ran to wherever and put money on a card. When I tried to put the card in, it wouldn't accept it because it said it wanted bitcoins. I informed Will and even had to show him the page that it wasn't going to post and he got furious and yelled at me. He turned and walked out of the room. I looked at everyone else and tried to apologize for his actions and to stay calm. It would be okay. He came right back in with a gun in his hand. I didn't even know he owned a gun. He hit me in the face with it and said I need to find somewhere else to post the ad or I'm done. And then he left. I don't know if he realized that he did it in front of the three girls. And I don't know what or I'm done meant either. I was so fucking terrified that that's when I knew I had to find my way to escape. I learned real quick that I wasn't able to just leave anytime I wanted to. After Amy got involved, Will changed. He started talking about taking us girls to New York and making big money and travel and go from here and there. And that alone scared the hell out of me. I wanted to build my life to get my kids back, not leave the state to trick, or maybe be killed or abandoned. No fucking way. I got fearful for my life when the gun hit me. I've been punched like a man, but I have never been hit with a gun. That night, I had a couple dates set up, and Will knew he had to take the girls and leave. I decided to make my plan to get away. The first date, I made 200. I put 50 in my purse and put 50 in the pocket of my bra, hidden away, and left the rest on the table. The second date, I made 150, put half hidden away, and the rest on the table. Will came in the door not long after I was finished and grabbed the money off the table. My purse was sitting right there, and I didn't see him do it, but he took the money out of my purse and said that he had to do something and left again. That's when I made my escape. I made 100 calls before I finally reached someone who was willing to help me. He had a friend come pick me up and bring me to his house. I will never forget the feeling I had when I was running out to the car with a trash bag full of my stuff that I had collected in the past three weeks. I was scared to death that he would be coming up and see me. That feeling didn't leave until we hit the highway. 
I wanted to tell the story because I never been able to get through telling it. I couldn't help to think where I would be if I stayed and if I would still be alive. So Will, let's not meet again.